This is section 17 of What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Simplified Alphabet This article, written during the autumn of 1899, was about the last writing done by Mark Twain on any impersonal subject. I have had a kindly feeling, a friendly feeling, a cousinly feeling toward simplified spelling from the beginning of the movement three years ago, but nothing more inflamed than that. It seemed to me to merely propose to substitute one inadequacy for another, a sort of patching and plugging poor old dental relics with cement and gold and porcelain paste. What was really wanted was a new set of teeth, that is to say, a new alphabet. The heart of our trouble is with our foolish alphabet. It doesn't know how to spell, and can't be taught. In this it is like all other alphabets except one, the phonographic. That is the only competent alphabet in the world. It can spell and correctly pronounce any word in our language. That admirable alphabet, that brilliant alphabet, that inspired alphabet, can be learned in an hour or two. In a week, the student can learn to write it with some little facility, and to read it with considerable ease. I know, for I saw it tried in a public school in Nevada forty-five years ago, and was so impressed by the incident that it has remained in my memory ever since. I wish we could adopt it in place of our present written and printed character. I mean simply the alphabet, simply the consonants and the vowels, I don't mean any reductions or abbreviations of them, such as the shorthand writer uses in order to get compression and speed. No, I would spell every word out. I will insert the alphabet here as I find it in Burnt's phonic shorthand. Figure 1. It is arranged on the basis of Isaac Pittman's phonography. Isaac Pittman was the originator and father of scientific phonography. It is used throughout the globe. It was a memorable invention. He made it public seventy-three years ago. The firm of Isaac Pittman and Sons, New York, still exists, and they continue the master's work. What should we gain? First of all, we could spell definitely and correctly any word you please just by the sound of it. We can't do that with our present alphabet. For instance, take a simple everyday word, thysis. If we tried to spell it by the sound of it, we should make it Tysis, and be laughed at by every educated person. Secondly, we should gain in reduction of labor in writing. Simplified spelling makes valuable reductions in the case of several hundred words, but the new spelling must be learned. You can't spell them by the sound. You must get them out of the book. But even if we knew the simplified form for every word in the language, the phonographic alphabet would still beat the simplified speller hands down in the important matter of economy of labor. I will illustrate. Present form, through, laugh, highland. Simplified form, through, laugh, highland. Phonographic form, figure two. To write the word through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H, the pen has to make twenty-one strokes. To write the word through, T-H-R-U, the pen has to make twelve strokes, a good saving. To write that same word with the phonographic alphabet, the pen has to make only three strokes. To write the word laugh, L-A-U-G-H, the pen has to make fourteen strokes. To write laugh, L-A-F-F, -F, the pen has to make the same number of strokes, no labor is saved to the penman. To write the same word with the phonographic alphabet, the pen has to make only three strokes. To write the word Highland, H-I-G-H-L-A-N-D, the pen has to make twenty-two strokes. To write Highland, H-Y-L-A-N-D, the pen has to make eighteen strokes. To write that word with the phonographic alphabet, the pen has to make only five strokes. Figure 3. To write the word phonographic alphabet, the pen has to make fifty-three strokes. To write phonographic, F-O-N-O-G-R-A-F-I-C, alphabet, A-L-F-A-B-E-T, the pen has to make fifty strokes. To the penman, the saving in labor is insignificant. To write that word, with vowels, with the phonographic alphabet, 
the pen has to make only seventeen strokes. Without the vowels, only thirteen strokes. Figure four. The vowels are hardly necessary this time. We make five pen strokes in writing an M. Thus, figure five, a stroke down, a stroke up, a second stroke down, a second stroke up, a final stroke down. Total five. The phonographic alphabet accomplishes the M with a single stroke, a curve, like a parenthesis that has come home drunk and has fallen face down right at the front door, where everybody that goes along will see him and say, Alas! When our written M is not the end of a word, but is otherwise located, it has to be connected with the next letter, and that requires another pen stroke, making six in all, before you get rid of that M. But never mind about the connecting strokes. Let them go. Without counting them, the twenty-six letters of our alphabet consumed about eighty pen-strokes for their construction, about three pen-strokes per letter. It is three times the number required by the phonographic alphabet. It requires but one stroke for each letter. My writing gait is—well, I don't know what it is, but I will time myself and see. Result, it is twenty-four words per minute. I don't mean composing, I mean copying— there isn't any definite composing gait. Very well, my copying gait is 1,440 words per hour, say 1,500. If I could use the phonographic character with facility, I could do the 1,500 in 20 minutes. I could do nine hours copying in three hours. I could do three years copying in one year. Also, if I had a typewriting machine with the phonographic alphabet on it, Oh, the miracles I could do! I am not pretending to write that character well. I have never had a lesson, and I am copying the letters from the book. But I can accomplish my desire, at any rate, which is to make the reader get a good and clear idea of the advantage it would be to us if we could discard our present alphabet and put this better one in its place, using it in books, newspapers, with the typewriter, and with the pen. Figure 6. Man, Dog, Horse I think it is graceful, and would look comely in print. And consider, once more, I beg, what a labor-saver it is. Ten pen-strokes with the one system to convey those three words above, and thirty-three by the other. Figure 7. I mean, in some ways, not in all. I suppose I might go so far as to say in most ways, and be within the facts, but never mind. Let it go at some one of the ways in which it exercises this birthright is, as I think, continuing to use our laughable alphabet these seventy-three years, while there was a rational one at hand, to be had for the taking. It has taken five hundred years to simplify some of Chaucer's rotten spelling, if I may be allowed to use so frank a term as that, and it will take five hundred more to get our exasperating new simplified corruptions accepted and running smoothly and we shan't be any better off then than we are now, for in that day we shall still have the privilege the simplifiers are exercising now. Anybody can change the spelling that wants to. But you can't change the phonographic spelling. There isn't any way. It will always follow the sound. If you want to change the spelling, you have to change the sound first. Mind, I myself am a simplified speller. I belong to that unhappy guild that is patiently and hopefully trying to reform our drunken old alphabet by reducing his whiskey. Well, it will improve him. When they get through, and have reformed him all they can by their system, he will be only half drunk. Above that condition, their system can never lift him. There is no competent and lasting and real reform for him but to take away his whiskey entirely, and fill up his jug with Pittman's wholesome and undiseased alphabet. One great drawback to simplified spelling is that in print a simplified word looks so like the very nation, and when you bunch a whole squadron of the simplified together, the spectacle is very nearly unendurable. The day may of course come when the public may be expected to get reconciled to the bizarre aspect of the simplified combinations. But, if I may be allowed the expression, is it worth the wasted time? Figure 8. 
to see our letters put together in ways to which we are not accustomed offends the eye and also takes the expression out of the words lay on macduff and damned be he who first cries hold enough it doesn't thrill you as it used to do the simplifications have sucked the thrill all out of it but a written character with which we are not acquainted does not offend us greek hebrew russian arabic and the others they have an interesting look and we see beauty in them too and this is true of hieroglyphics as well there is something pleasant and engaging about the mathematical signs when we do not understand them the mystery hidden in these things has a fascination for us we can't come across a printed page of shorthand without being impressed by it and wishing we could read it very well what i am offering for acceptance and adoption is not shorthand but longhand written with the shorthand alphabet unreduced you can write three times as many words in a minute with it as you can write with our alphabet and so in a way it is properly a shorthand it has a pleasant look too a beguiling look an inviting look i will write something in it in my rude and untaught way figure nine even when i do it it comes out prettier than it does in simplified spelling yes and in the simplified it costs one hundred and twenty-three pen strokes to write it whereas in the phonographic it costs only twenty-nine figure ten is probably figure eleven let us hope so anyway end of section seventeen a simplified alphabet this is section eighteen of what is man and other essays by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain as concerns interpreting the deity one this line of hieroglyphs was for fourteen years the despair of all the scholars who labored over the mysteries of the rosetta stone figure one after five years of study champollion translated it thus therefore let the worship of epiphanes be maintained in all the temples this upon pain of death that was the twenty-fourth translation that had been furnished by scholars for a time it stood but only for a time then doubts began to assail it and undermine it and the scholars resumed their labors three years of patient work produced eleven new translations among them this by grunfeld was received with considerable favor the horse of epiphanes shall be maintained at the public expense this upon pain of death but the following rendering by gospodin was received by the learned world with yet greater favor the priest shall explain the wisdom of epiphanes to all these people and these shall listen with reverence upon pain of death seven years followed in which twenty-one fresh and widely varying renderings were scored none of them quite convincing but now at last came rawlinson the youngest of all the scholars with a translation which was immediately and universally recognized as being the correct version and his name became famous in a day so famous indeed that even the children were familiar with it and such a noise did the achievement itself make that not even the noise of the monumental political event of that same year the flight from elba was able to smother it to silence rawlinson's version reads as follows therefore walk not away from the wisdom of epiphanes but turn and follow it so shall it conduct thee to the temple's peace and soften for thee the sorrows of life and the pains of death here is another difficult text figure two it is demotic a style of egyptian writing and a phase of the language which had perished from the knowledge of all men twenty five hundred years before the christian era our red indians have left many records in the form of pictures upon our crags and boulders it has taken our most gifted and painstaking students two centuries to get at the meanings hidden in these pictures yet there are still two little lines of hieroglyphics among the figures grouped upon the dighton rocks which they have not succeeded in interpreting to their satisfaction these figure three 
the suggested solutions of this riddle are practically innumerable they would fill a book thus we have infinite trouble in solving man-made mysteries it is only when we set out to discover the secret of god that our difficulties disappear it was always so in antique roman times it was the custom of the deity to try to conceal his intentions in the entrails of birds and this was patiently and hopefully continued century after century although the attempted concealment never succeeded in a single recorded instance the augurs could read entrails as easily as a modern child can read coarse print roman history is full of the marvels of interpretation which these extraordinary men performed these strange and wonderful achievements move our awe and compel our admiration those men could pierce to the marrow of a mystery instantly if the rosetta stone idea had been introduced it would have defeated them but entrails had no embarrassments for them entrails have gone out now entrails and dreams it was at last found out that as hiding places for the divine intentions they were inadequate a part of the wall of Velletri, having in former times been struck with thunder the response of the soothsayers was that a native of that town would some time or other arrive at supreme power bones suetonius page one thirty eight some time or other it looks indefinite but no matter it happened all the same one needed only to wait and be patient and keep watch then he would find out that the thunderstroke had caesar augustus in mind and had come to give notice there were other advance advertisements one of them appeared just before caesar augustus was born and was most poetic and touching and romantic in its feelings and aspects it was a dream it was dreamed by caesar augustus's mother and interpreted at the usual rates atia before her delivery dreamed that her bowels stretched to the stars and expanded through the whole circuit of heaven and earth suetonius page one thirty nine that was in the augur's line and furnished him no difficulties but it would have taken rawlinson and champollion fourteen years to make sure of what it meant because they would have been surprised and dizzy it would have been too late to be valuable then and the bill for service would have been barred by the statute of limitation in those old roman days a gentleman's education was not complete until he had taken a theological course at the seminary and learned how to translate entrails caesar augustus's education received this final polish all through his life whenever he had poultry on the menu he saved the interiors and kept himself informed of the deity's plans by exercising upon those interiors the arts of augury in his first consulship while he was observing the auguries twelve vultures presented themselves as they had done to romulus and when he offered sacrifice the livers of all the victims were folded inward in the lower part a circumstance which was regarded by those present who had skill in things of that nature as an indubitable prognostic of great and wonderful fortune suetonius page one forty one indubitable is a strong word but no doubt it was justified if the livers were really turned that way in those days chicken livers were strangely and delicately sensitive to coming events no matter how far off they might be and they could never keep still but would curl and squirm like that particularly when vultures came and showed interest in that approaching great event and in breakfast two we may now skip eleven hundred and thirty or forty years which brings us down to enlightened christian times and the troubled days of king stephen of england the augur has had his day and has been long ago forgotten the priest had fallen heir to his trade king henry is dead stephen that bold and outrageous person comes flying over from normandy to steal the throne from henry's daughter he accomplished his crime and henry of huntington a priest of high degree mourns over it in his chronicle the archbishop of canterbury consecrated stephen wherefore the lord visited the archbishop with the same judgment which he had inflicted upon him who struck jeremiah the great priest he died within a year stephen's was the greater offence but stephen could wait 
not so the archbishop apparently the kingdom was a prey to intestine wars slaughter fire and rapine spread ruin throughout the land cries of distress horror and woe rose in every quarter that was the result of stephen's crime these unspeakable conditions continued during nineteen years then stephen died as comfortably as any man ever did and was honorably buried it makes one pity the poor archbishop and wish that he too could have been let off as leniently how did henry of huntington know that the archbishop was sent to his grave by judgment of god for consecrating stephen he does not explain neither does he explain why stephen was awarded a pleasanter death than he was entitled to while the aged king henry his predecessor who had ruled england thirty-five years to the people's strongly worded satisfaction was condemned to close his life in circumstances most distinctly unpleasant inconvenient and disagreeable his was probably the most uninspiring funeral that is set down in history there is not a detail about it that is attractive it seems to have been just the funeral for stephen and even at this far distant day it is matter of just regret that by an indiscretion the wrong man got it whenever god punishes a man henry of huntington knows why it was done and tells us and his pen is eloquent with admiration but when a man has earned punishment and escapes he does not explain he is evidently puzzled but he does not say anything i think it is often apparent that he is pained by these discrepancies but loyally tries his best not to show it when he cannot praise he delivers himself of a silence so marked that a suspicious person could mistake it for suppressed criticism however he has plenty of opportunities to feel contented with the way things go his book is full of them king david of scotland under color of religion caused his followers to deal most barbarously with the english they ripped open women tossed children on the points of spears butchered priests at the altars and cutting off the heads from the images on crucifixes placed them on the bodies of the slain while in exchange they fixed on the crucifixes the heads of their victims wherever the scots came there was the same scene of horror and cruelty women shrieking old men lamenting amid the groans of the dying and the despair of the living but the english got the victory then the chief of the men of lothian fell pierced by an arrow and all his followers were put to flight for the almighty was offended at them and their strength was rent like a cobweb offended at them for what for committing those fearful butcheries no for that was the common custom on both sides and not open to criticism then was it for doing the butcheries under cover of religion no that was not it religious feeling was often expressed in that fervent way all through those old centuries the truth is he was not offended at them at all he was only offended at their king who had been false to an oath then why did not he put the punishment upon the king instead of upon them it is a difficult question one can see by the chronicle that the judgments fell rather customarily upon the wrong person but henry of huntington does not explain why here is one that went true and the chronicler's satisfaction in it is not hidden in the month of august providence displayed its justice in a remarkable manner for two of the nobles who had converted monasteries into fortifications expelling the monks their sin being the same met with a similar punishment robert marmion was one godfrey de mandeville the other robert marmion issuing forth against the enemy was slain under the walls of the monastery being the only one who fell though he was surrounded by his troops dying excommunicated he became subject to death everlasting in like manner earl godfrey was singled out among his followers and shot with an arrow by a common foot-soldier he made light of the wound but he died of it in a few days under excommunication see here the like judgment of god memorable through all ages this exaltation jars upon me not because of the death of the men for they deserve that but because it is death eternal in white-hot fire and flame 
It makes my flesh crawl. I have not known more than three men, or perhaps four, in my whole lifetime, whom I would rejoice to see writhing in those fires for even a year, let alone forever. I believe I would relent before the year was up, and get them out if I could. I think that in the long run, if a man's wife and babies, who had not harmed me, should come crying and pleading, I couldn't stand it. I know I should forgive him and let him go, even if he had violated a monastery. Henry of Huntington has been watching Godfrey and Marmion for nearly seven hundred and fifty years now, but I couldn't do it, I know I couldn't. I am soft and gentle in my nature, and I should have forgiven them seventy and seven times long ago, and I think God has. But this is only an opinion, and not authoritative, like Henry of Huntington's interpretations. I could learn to interpret, but I have never tried. I get so little time. All through his book Henry exhibits his familiarity with the intentions of God, and with the reasons for his intentions. Sometimes, very often in fact, the act follows the intention after such a wide interval of time that one wonders how Henry could fit one act out of a hundred to one intention out of a hundred, and get the thing right every time, when there was such abundant choice among acts and intentions. Sometimes a man offends the deity with a crime, and is punished for it thirty years later. Meantime he has committed a million other crimes. No matter, Henry can pick out the one that brought the worms. Worms were generally used in those days for the slaying of particularly wicked people. This has gone out now, but in old times it was a favorite. It always indicated a case of wrath. For instance, the just God, avenging Robert Fitzhildebrand's perfidy, a worm grew in his vitals, which gradually gnawing its way through his intestines, fattened on the abandoned man till, tortured with excruciating sufferings and venting himself in bitter moans, he was, by a fitting punishment, brought to his end. P. 400. It was probably an alligator, but we cannot tell. We only know it was a particular breed, and only used to convey wrath. Some authorities think it was an ichthyosaurus, but there is much doubt. However, one thing we do know, and that is that that worm had been due years and years. Robert F. had violated a monastery once. He had committed unprintable crimes since, and they had been permitted, under disapproval. But the ravishment of the monastery had not been forgotten nor forgiven, and the worm came at last. Why were these reforms put off in this strange way? What was to be gained by it? Did Henry of Huntington really know his facts, or was he only guessing? Sometimes I am half persuaded that he is only a guesser, and not a good one. The divine wisdom must surely be of the better quality than he makes it out to be. Five hundred years before Henry's time, some forecasts of the Lord's purposes were furnished by a pope, who perceived, by certain perfectly trustworthy signs furnished by the deity for the information of his familiars, that the end of the world was about to come. But as this end of the world draws near, many things are at hand which have not before happened. As changes in the air, terrible signs in the heavens, tempests out of the common order of the seasons, wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places, all which will not happen in our days, but after our days all will come to pass. Still the end was so near that these signs were sent before that we may be careful for our souls and be found prepared to meet the impending judgment. That was thirteen hundred years ago. This is really no improvement on the work of the Roman augurs. End of section 18. As concerns interpreting the deity. This is section 19 of What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning Tobacco. Written about 1893, not before published. As concerns tobacco, there are many superstitions and the chiefest is this. 
that there is a standard governing the matter, whereas there is nothing of the kind. Each man's own preference is the only standard for him, the only one which he can accept, the only one which can command him. A Congress of all the tobacco lovers in the world could not elect a standard which would be binding upon you or me, or would even much influence us. The next superstition is that a man has a standard of his own. He hasn't. He thinks he has, but he hasn't. He thinks he can tell what he regards as a good cigar from what he regards as a bad one, but he can't. He goes by the brand, yet imagines he goes by the flavor. One may palm off the worst counterfeit upon him. If it bears his brand, he will smoke it contentedly and never suspect. Children of twenty-five, who have seven years of experience, try to tell me what is a good cigar and what isn't. Me, who never learned to smoke, but always smoked. Me, who came into the world asking for a light. No one can tell me what is a good cigar, for me. I am the only judge. People who claim to know say that I smoke the worst cigars in the world. They bring their own cigars when they come to my house. They betray an unmanly terror when I offer them a cigar. They tell lies and hurry away to meet engagements which they have not made when they are threatened with the hospitalities of my box. Now then, observe what superstition, assisted by a man's reputation, can do. I was to have twelve personal friends to supper one night. One of them was as notorious for costly and elegant cigars as I was for cheap and devilish ones. I called at his house, and when no one was looking, borrowed a double handful of his very choicest. Cigars which cost him forty cents apiece, and bore red and gold labels in sign of their nobility. I removed the labels and put the cigars into a box with my favorite brand on it, a brand which those people all knew, and which cowed them as men are cowed by an epidemic. They took these cigars when offered at the end of the supper, and lit them and sternly struggled with them in dreary silence, for hilarity died when the fell brand came into view and started around. But their fortitude held for a short time only. Then they made excuses and filed out, treading on one another's heels with indecent eagerness, and in the morning, when I went out to observe results, the cigars lay all between the front door and the gate, all except one. That one lay in the plate of the man from whom I had cabbaged the lot. One or two whiffs was all he could stand. He told me afterward that some day I would get shot for giving people that kind of cigars to smoke. Am I certain of my own standard? Perfectly. Yes, absolutely. Unless somebody fools me by putting my brand on some other kind of cigar. For no doubt I am like the rest, and know my cigar by the brand instead of by the flavor. However, my standard is a pretty wide one, and covers a good deal of territory. To me, almost any cigar is good that nobody else will smoke, and to me, almost all cigars are bad that other people consider good. Nearly any cigar will do me, except a Havana. People think they hurt my feelings when they come to my house with their life preservers on, I mean, with their own cigars in their pockets. It is an error. I take care of myself in a similar way. When I go into danger, that is, into rich people's houses, where, in the nature of things, they will have high-tariff cigars, red and gilt-girded and nested in a rosewood box along with a damp sponge, cigars which develop a dismal black ash and burn down the side and smell, and will grow hot to the fingers, and will go on growing hotter and hotter, and go on smelling more and more infamously and unendurably the deeper the fire tunnels down inside below the thimbleful of honest tobacco that is in the front end, the furnisher of it praising it all the time and telling you how much the deadly thing cost. Yes, when I go into that sort of peril, I carry my own defense along. I carry my own brand. Twenty-seven cents a barrel. And I live to see my family again. I may seem to light his red-gartered cigar, but that is only for courtesy's sake. I smuggle it into my pocket for the poor, of whom I know many, and light one of my own, and while he praises it, I join in, but when he says it costs forty-five cents, I say nothing, for I know better. However, to say true, 
my tastes are so catholic that i have never seen any cigars that i really could not smoke except those that cost a dollar apiece i have examined those and know that they are made of dog hair and not good dog hair at that i have a thoroughly satisfactory time in europe for all over the continent one finds cigars which not even the most hardened newsboys in new york would smoke i brought cigars with me the last time i will not do that any more in italy as in france the government is the only cigar peddler italy has three or four domestic brands the minghetti the trabuco the virginia and a very coarse one which is a modification of the virginia the minghettis are large and comely and cost three dollars and sixty cents a hundred i can smoke a hundred in seven days and enjoy every one of them the trabucos suit me too i don't remember the price but one has to learn to like the virginia nobody is born friendly to it it looks like a rat-tail file but smokes better some think it has a straw through it you pull this out and it leaves a flue otherwise there would be no draught not even as much as there is to a nail some prefer a nail at first however i like all the french swiss german and italian domestic cigars and have never cared to inquire what they are made of and nobody would know anyhow perhaps there is even a brand of european smoking tobacco that i like it is a brand used by the italian peasants it is loose and dry and black and looks like tea grounds when the fire is applied it expands and climbs up and towers above the pipe and presently tumbles off inside of one's vest the tobacco itself is cheap but it raises the insurance it is as i remarked in the beginning the taste for tobacco is a matter of superstition there are no standards no real standards each man's preference is the only standard for him the only one which he can accept the only one which can command him end of section 19 concerning tobacco this is section 20 of what is man and other essays by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain the bee written about 1893 not before published it was maeterlinck who introduced me to the bee i mean in the psychical and in the poetical way i had had a business introduction earlier it was when i was a boy it is strange that i should remember a formality like that so long it must be nearly sixty years bee scientists always speak of the bee as she it is because all the important bees are of that sex in the hive there is one married bee called the queen she has fifty thousand children of these about one hundred are sons the rest are daughters some of the daughters are young maids some are old maids and all are virgins and remain so every spring the queen comes out of the hive and flies away with one of her sons and marries him the honeymoon lasts only an hour or two then the queen divorces her husband and returns home competent to lay two million eggs this will be enough to last the year but not more than enough because hundreds of bees get drowned every day and other hundreds are eaten by birds and it is the queen's business to keep the population up to standard say fifty thousand she must always have that many children on hand and efficient during the busy season which is summer or winter would catch the community short of food she lays from two thousand to three thousand eggs a day according to the demand and she must exercise judgment and not lay more than are needed in a slim flower harvest nor fewer than are required in a prodigal one or the board of directors will dethrone her and elect a queen that has more sense there are always a few royal heirs in stock and ready to take her place ready and more than anxious to do it although she is their own mother these girls are kept by themselves and are regally fed and tended from birth no other bees get such fine food as they get or live such a high and luxurious life by consequence they are larger and longer and sleeker than their working sisters and they have a curved sting shaped like a scimitar 
while the others have a straight one. A common bee will sting anyone or anybody, but a royalty stings royalties only. A common bee will sting and kill another common bee for cause, but when it is necessary to kill the queen, other ways are employed. When a queen has grown old and slack and does not lay eggs enough, one of her royal daughters is allowed to come to attack her, the rest of the bees looking on at the duel and seeing fair play. It is a duel with the curved stings. If one of the fighters gets hard-pressed and gives it up and runs, she is brought back and must try again, once, maybe twice. Then, if she runs yet once more for her life, judicial death is her portion. Her children pack themselves into a ball around her person and hold her in that compact grip two or three days until she starves to death or is suffocated. Meantime the victor bee is receiving royal honors and performing the one royal function, laying eggs. As regards the ethics of the judicial assassination of the queen, that is a matter of politics, and will be discussed later in its proper place. During substantially the whole of her short life of five or six years, the queen lives in the Egyptian darkness and stately seclusion of the royal apartments, with none about her but plebeian servants, who give her empty lip affection in place of the love which her heart hungers for, who spy upon her in the interest of her waiting heirs, and report and exaggerate her defects and deficiencies to them, who fawn upon her and flatter her to her face and slander her behind her back, who grovel before her in the day of her power and forsake her in her age and weakness. There she sits, friendless, upon her throne through the long night of her life, cut off from the consoling sympathies and sweet companionship and loving endearments which she craves, by the gilded barriers of her awful rank, a forlorn exile in her own house and home, weary object of formal ceremonies and machine-made worship, winged child of the sun, native to the free air and the blue skies and the flowery fields, doomed by the splendid accident of her birth to trade this priceless heritage for a black captivity, a tinsel grandeur, and a loveless life, with shame and insult at the end, and a cruel death, and condemned by the human instinct in her to hold the bargain valuable. Huber, Lubbock, Maeterlinck, in fact all the great authorities, are agreed in denying that the bee is a member of the human family. I do not know why they have done this, but I think it is from dishonest motives. Why, the innumerable facts brought to light by their own painstaking and exhaustive experiments prove that if there is a master fool in the world, it is the bee. That seems to settle it. But that is the way of the scientist. He will spend thirty years in building up a mountain range of facts with the intent to prove a certain theory. Then he is so happy in his achievement that as a rule he overlooks the main chief fact of all that his accumulation proves an entirely different thing. When you point out this miscarriage to him, he does not answer your letters. When you call to convince him, the servant prevaricates, and you do not get in. Scientists have odious manners, except when you prop up their theory. Then you can borrow money of them. To be strictly fair, I will concede that now and then one of them will answer your letter, but when they do they avoid the issue. You cannot pin them down. When I discovered that the bee was human, I wrote about it to all those scientists whom I have just mentioned. For evasions I have seen nothing to equal the answers I got. After the queen, the personage next in importance in the hive, is the virgin. The virgins are fifty thousand, or one hundred thousand in number, and they are the workers, the laborers. No work is done, in the hive or out of it, save by them. The males do not work, the queen does no work, unless laying eggs is work, but it does not seem so to me. There are only two million of them, anyway, and all of the five months to finish the contract in. The distribution of work in a hive is as cleverly and elaborately specialized as it is in a vast American machine shop or factory. A bee that has been trained to one of the many and various industries of the concern doesn't know how to exercise any other, 
and would be offended if asked to take a hand in anything outside of her profession. She is as human as a cook, and if you should ask the cook to wait on the table, <laughs> you know what would happen. Cooks will play the piano if you like, but they draw the line there. In my time I have asked a cook to chop wood, and I know about these things. Even the hired girl has her frontiers. True, they are vague, they are ill-defined, even flexible, but they are there. This is not conjecture. It is founded on the absolute. And then the butler. You ask the butler to wash the dog. It is just as I say, there is much to be learned in these ways, without going to books. Books are very well, but books do not cover the whole domain of ascetic human culture. Pride of profession is one of the boniest bones in existence, if not the boniest. Without doubt it is so in the hive. End of section 20. The Bee. This is section 21 of What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Taming the Bicycle in the early eighties Mark Twain learned to ride one of the old high-wheel bicycles of that period. He wrote an account of his experience, but did not offer it for publication. The form of bicycle he rode long ago became antiquated, but in the humor of his pleasantry is a quality which does not grow old. Albert Bigelow Payne Part One. I thought the matter over and concluded I could do it. So I went down and bought a barrel of Pond's Extract and a bicycle. The expert came home with me to instruct me. We chose the back yard, for the sake of privacy, and went to work. Mine was not a full-grown bicycle, but only a colt, a fifty-inch, with the pedals shortened up to forty-eight, and skittish, like any other colt. The expert explained the thing's points briefly. Then he got on its back and rode around a little to show me how easy it was to do. He said that the dismounting was perhaps the hardest thing to learn, and so we would leave that to the last. But he was an error there. He found, to his surprise and joy, that all he needed to do was to get me onto the machine and stand out of the way. I could get off myself. Although I was wholly inexperienced, I dismounted in the best time on record. He was on that side, shoving up the machine. We all came down with a crash, he at the bottom, I next, and the machine on top. We examined the machine, but it was not in the least injured. This was hardly believable. Yet the expert assured me that it was true. In fact, the examination proved it. I was partly to realize then how admirably these things are constructed. We applied some Pond's extract and resumed. The expert got on the other side to shove up this time, but I dismounted on that side, so the result was as before. The machine was not hurt. We oiled ourselves up again and resumed. This time the expert took up a sheltered position behind, but somehow or other we landed on him again. He was full of surprised admiration, said it was abnormal. She was all right, not a scratch on her, not a timber started anywhere. I said it was wonderful, while we were greasing up, but he said that when I came to know these steel spider-webs I would realize that nothing but dynamite could cripple them. Then he limped out to position and we resumed once more. This time the expert took up the position of shortstop and got a man to shove up behind. We got up a handsome speed and presently traversed a brick, and I went out over the top of the tiller and landed, head down, on the instructor's back and saw the machine fluttering in the air between me and the sun. It was well it came down on us, for that broke the fall, and it was not injured. Five days later I got out and was carried down to the hospital, and found the expert doing pretty fairly. In a few more days I was quite sound. I attribute this to my prudence in always dismounting on something soft. Some recommend a feather bed, but I think an expert is better. The expert got out at last, brought four assistants with him. It was a good idea. These four held the graceful cobweb upright while I climbed into the saddle. 
then they formed in column and marched on either side of me while the expert pushed behind all hands assisted at the dismount the bicycle had what is called the wobbles and had them very badly in order to keep my position a good many things were required of me and in every instance the thing required was against nature against nature but not against the laws of nature that is to say that whatever the needed thing might be my nature habit and breeding moved me to attempt it in one way while some immutable and unsuspected law of physics required that it be done in just the other way i perceived by this how radically and grotesquely wrong had been the lifelong education of my body and members they were steeped in ignorance they knew nothing nothing which it could profit them to know for instance if i found myself falling to the right i put the tiller hard down the other way by a quite natural impulse and so violated a law and kept on going down the law required the opposite thing the big wheel must be turned in the direction in which you are falling it is hard to believe this when you are told it and not merely hard to believe it but impossible it is opposed to all your notions and it is just as hard to do it after you do come to believe it believing it and knowing by the most convincing proof that it is true does not help it you can't any more do it than you could before you can neither force nor persuade yourself to do it at first the intellect has to come to the front now it has to teach the limbs to discard their old education and adopt the new the steps of one's progress are distinctly marked at the end of each lesson he knows he has acquired something and he also knows what that something is and likewise that it will stay with him it is not like studying german where you mull along in a groping uncertain way for thirty years and at last just as you think you've got it they spring the subjunctive on you and there you are no and i see now plainly enough that the great pity about the german language is that you can't fall off it and hurt yourself there is nothing like that feature to make you attend strictly to business but i also see by what i have learned of bicycling that the right and only sure way to learn german is by the bicycling method that is to say take a grip on one villainy of it at a time and learn it not ease up and shirk to the next leaving that one half learned when you have reached the point in bicycling where you can balance the machine tolerably fairly and propel it and steer it then comes your next task how to mount it you do it in this way you hop along behind it on your right foot resting the other on the mounting peg and grasping the tiller with your hands at the word you rise on the peg stiffen your left leg hang your other one around in the air in a general and indefinite way lean your stomach against the rear of the saddle and then fall off maybe on one side maybe on the other but you fall off you get up and do it again and once more and then several times by this time you have learned to keep your balance and also to steer without wrenching the tiller out by the roots i say tiller because it is a tiller handlebar is a lamely descriptive phrase so you steer along straight ahead a little while then you rise forward with a steady strain bringing your right leg and then your body into the saddle catch your breath fetch a violent hitch this way and then that and down you go again but you have ceased to mind the going down by this time you are getting to light on one foot or the other with considerable certainty six more attempts and six more falls make you perfect you land in the saddle comfortably next time and stay there that is if you can be content to let your legs dangle and leave the pedals alone a while but if you grab at once for the pedals you are gone again you soon learn to wait a little and perfect your balance before reaching for the pedals then the mounting art is acquired is complete and a little practice will make it simple and easy to you though spectators ought to keep off a rod or two to one side along at first if you have nothing against them and now you come to the voluntary dismount you learn the other kind first of all it is quite easy to tell one how to do the voluntary dismount the words are few the requirement simple and apparently undifficult 
let your left pedal go down till your left leg is nearly straight turn your wheel to the left and get off as you would from a horse it certainly does sound exceedingly easy but it isn't i don't know why it isn't but it isn't try as you may you don't get down as you would from a horse you get down as you would from a house afire you make a spectacle of yourself every time two during eight days i took a daily lesson of an hour and a half at the end of this twelve working hours apprenticeship i was graduated in the rough i was pronounced competent to paddle my own bicycle without outside help it seems incredible this celerity of acquirement it takes considerably longer than that to learn horseback riding in the rough now it is true that i could have learned without a teacher but it would have been risky for me because of my natural clumsiness the self-taught man seldom knows anything accurately and he does not know a tenth as much as he could have known if he had worked under teachers and besides he brags and is the means of fooling other thoughtless people into going and doing as he himself has done there are those who imagine that the unlucky accidents of life life's experiences are in some way useful to us i wish i could find out how i never knew one of them to happen twice they always change off and swap around and catch you on your inexperienced side if personal experience can be worth anything as an education it wouldn't seem likely that you could trip methuselah and yet if that old person could come back here it is more than likely that one of the first things he would do would be to take hold of one of these electric wires and tie himself all up in a knot now the surer thing and the wiser thing would be for him to ask somebody whether it was a good thing to take hold of but that would not suit him he would be one of the self-taught kind that go by experience he would want to examine for himself and he would find for his instruction that the coiled patriarch shuns the electric wire and it would be useful to him too and would leave his education in quite a complete and rounded out condition till he should come again some day and go to bouncing a dynamite can around to find out what was in it but we wander from the point however get a teacher it saves much time and pond's extract before taking final leave of me my instructor inquired concerning my physical strength and i was able to inform him that i hadn't any he said that that was a defect which would make uphill wheeling pretty difficult for me at first but he also said the bicycle would soon remove it the contrast between his muscles and mine was quite marked he wanted to test mine so i offered my biceps which was my best it almost made him smile he said it is pulpy and soft and yielding and rounded it evades pressure and glides from under the fingers in the dark a body might think it was an oyster in a rag perhaps this made me look grieved for he added briskly oh well, that's all right you needn't worry about that in a little while you can't tell it from a petrified kidney just go right along with your practice you're all right then he left me and i started out alone to seek adventures you don't really have to seek them that is nothing but a phrase they come to you i chose a reposeful sabbath day sort of a back street which was about thirty yards wide between the curbstones i knew it was not wide enough uh, still i thought that by keeping strict watch and wasting no space unnecessarily i could crowd through of course i had trouble mounting the machine entirely on my own responsibility with no encouraging moral support from the outside no sympathetic instructor to say good now you're doing well good again uh, don't hurry there now you're all right brace up go ahead in place of this i had some other support this was a boy who was perched on a gate-post munching a hunk of maple sugar he was full of interest and comment the first time i failed and went down he said that if he was me he would dress up in pillows that's what he would do the next time i went down he advised me to go and learn to ride a tricycle first the third time i collapsed he said he didn't believe i could stay on a horse car but the next time i succeeded and got clumsily under way in a weaving tottering uncertain fashion and occupying pretty much all of the street 
my slow and lumbering gait filled the boy to the chin with scorn and he sung out my but don't he rip along then he got down from his post and loafed along the sidewalk still observing and occasionally commenting presently he dropped into my wake and followed along behind a little girl passed by balancing a washboard on her head and giggled and seemed about to make a remark but the boy said rebukingly let him alone he's going to a funeral i have been familiar with that street for years and had always supposed it was a dead level but it was not as the bicycle now informed me to my surprise the bicycle in the hands of a novice is as alert and acute as a spirit level in the detecting of delicate and vanishing shades of difference in these matters it notices a rise where your untrained eye would not observe that one existed it notices any decline which water will run down i was toiling up a slight rise but was not aware of it it made me tug and pant and perspire and still labor as i might the machine came almost to a standstill every little while at such times the boy would say that's it take a rest there ain't no hurry they can't hold a funeral without you stones were a bother to me even the smallest ones gave me a panic when i went over them i could hit any kind of a stone no matter how small if i tried to miss it and of course at first i couldn't help trying to do that it is but natural it is part of the ass that has put in us all for some inscrutable reason i was at the end of my course at last and it was necessary for me to turn round too this is not a pleasant thing when you undertake it for the first time on your own responsibility and neither is it likely to succeed your confidence oozes away you fill steadily up with nameless apprehensions every fibre of you is tense with a watchful strain you start a cautious and gradual curve but your squirmy nerves are all full of electric anxieties so the curve is quickly demoralized into a jerky and perilous zigzag then suddenly the nickel-clad horse takes the bit in its mouth and goes slanting for the curbstone defying all prayers and all your powers to change its mind your heart stands still your breath hangs fire your legs forget to work straight on you go and there are but a couple of feet between you and the curb now and now is the desperate moment the last chance to save yourself of course all your instructions fly out of your head and you whirl your wheel away from the curb instead of toward it and so you go sprawling on that granite-bound inhospitable shore that was my luck that was my experience i dragged myself out from under the indestructible bicycle and sat down on the curb to examine i started on the return trip it was now that i saw a farmer's wagon poking along down toward me loaded with cabbages if i needed anything to perfect the precariousness of my steering it was just that the farmer was occupying the middle of the road with his wagon leaving barely fourteen or fifteen yards of space on either side i couldn't shout at him a beginner can't shout if he opens his mouth he is gone he must keep all his attention on his business but in this grisly emergency the boy came to the rescue and for once i had to be grateful to him he kept a sharp lookout on the swiftly varying impulses and inspirations of my bicycle and shouted to the man accordingly to the left turn to the left or this jackass'll run over you the man started to do it no to the right to the right hold on that won't do to the left to the right to the left right left r stay where you are or you're a goner and just then i caught the off horse in the starboard and went down in a pile i said hang it couldn't you see i was coming yes i see you was coming but i couldn't tell which way you was coming nobody could now could they you couldn't yourself now could you so what could i do there was something in that and so i had the magnanimity to say so i said i was no doubt as much to blame as he was within the next five days i achieved so much progress that the boy couldn't keep up with me he had to go back to his gate-post and content himself with watching me fall at long range there was a row of low stepping-stones across one end of the street a measured yard apart 
even after I got so I could steer pretty fairly, I was so afraid of those stones that I always hit them. They gave me the worst falls I ever got in that street, except those which I got from dogs. I have seen it stated that no expert is quick enough to run over a dog, that a dog is always able to skip out of his way. I think that that may be true, but I think that the reason he couldn't run over the dog was because he was trying to. I did not try to run over any dog, but I ran over every dog that came along. I think it makes a great deal of difference. If you try to run over the dog, he knows how to calculate. But if you are trying to miss him, he does not know how to calculate, and is liable to jump the wrong way every time. It was always so in my experience. Even when I could not hit a wagon, I could hit a dog that came to see me practice. They all liked to see me practice, and they all came, for there was very little going on in our neighborhood to entertain a dog. It took time to learn to miss a dog, but I achieved even that. I can steer as well as I want to now, and I will catch that boy out one of these days and run over him if he doesn't reform. Get a bicycle. You will not regret it if you live. End of section 21. Taming the Bicycle. This is section 22 of What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Is Shakespeare Dead? Sections 1, 2, and 3. From my autobiography. Scattered here and there through the stacks of unpublished manuscript which constitute this formidable autobiography and diary of mine, certain chapters will in some distant future be found which deal with claimants, claimants historically notorious, Satan, claimant, the golden calf, claimant, the veiled prophet of Corazan, claimant, Louis the Seventeenth, claimant, William Shakespeare, claimant, Arthur Orton, claimant, Mary Baker G. Eddy, claimant, and the rest of them, eminent claimants, successful claimants, defeated claimants, royal claimants, plebe claimants, showy claimants, shabby claimants, revered claimants, despised claimants, twinkle star-like here and there, and yonder, through the mists of history and legend and tradition, and, oh, all the darling tribe are clothed in mystery and romance, and we read about them with deep interest, and discuss them with loving sympathy, or with rancorous resentment, according to which side we hitch ourselves to. It has always been so with the human race. There was never a claimant that couldn't get a hearing, nor one that couldn't accumulate a rapturous following, no matter how flimsy and apparently unauthentic his claim might be. Arthur Orton's claim that he was the lost tick-born baronet come to life again was as flimsy as Mrs. Eddy's that she wrote Science and Health from the direct dictation of the deity. Yet in England, nearly forty years ago, Orton had a huge army of devotees and incorrigible adherents, many of whom remained stubbornly unconvinced after their fat god had been proven an impostor and jailed as a perjurer. And today Mrs. Eddy's following is not only immense, but is daily augmenting in numbers and enthusiasm. Orton had many fine and educated minds among his adherents. Mrs. Eddy has had the like among hers from the beginning. Her church is as well equipped in those particulars as is any other church. Claimants can always count upon a following. It doesn't matter who they are, nor what they claim, nor whether they come with documents or without. It was always so. Down out of the long-vanished past, across the abyss of the ages. If you listen, you can still hear the believing multitude shouting for Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel. A friend has sent me a new book from England, The Shakespeare Problem Restated. Well restated and closely reasoned, 
and my fifty years' interest in that matter, asleep for the last three years, is excited once more. It is an interest which was born of Delia Bacon's book, away back in that ancient day, 1857, or maybe 1856. About a year later, my pilot-master, Bixby, transferred me from his own steamboat to the Pennsylvania, and placed me under the orders and instructions of George Ealer, dead now these many, many years. I steered for him a good many months, as was the humble duty of the pilot-apprentice, stood a daylight watch, and spun the wheel under the severe superintendence and correction of the master. He was a prime chess-player and an idolater of Shakespeare. He would play chess with anybody, even with me, and it cost his official dignity something to do that. Also, quite uninvited, he would read Shakespeare to me, not just casually, but by the hour, when it was his watch and I was steering. He read well, but not profitably for me, because he constantly injected commands into the text. That broke it all up, mixed it all up, tangled it all up, to that degree, in fact, that if we were in a risky and difficult piece of river, an ignorant person couldn't have told sometimes which observations were Shakespeare's and which were Ealer's. For instance, What man dare? I dare. Approach thou what are you laying in the leads for? What a hell of an idea! Like the rugged ease her off a little, ease her off, rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, or the there she goes, meet her, meet her, didn't you know she'd smell the reef if you crowded it like that? Hurricane Tiger, take any shape but that, and my firm nerves she'll be in the woods the first you know. Stop the starboard. Come ahead, strong on the larboard. Back the starboard. Now, then, you're all right. Come ahead on the starboard. Straighten up and go long, never tremble. Or be alive again, and dare me to desert. Damnation, can't you keep away from that greasy water? Pull her down, snatch her! Snatch her, bald-headed with thy sword. If trembling I inhabit them, lay in the leads. No, only with the starboard one. Leave the other alone. Protest me, the baby of a girl. Hence horrible shadow. Eight bells. That watchman's asleep again, I reckon. Go down and call Brown yourself. Unreal mockery. Hence. He certainly was a good reader, and splendidly thrilling and stormy and tragic, but it was a damage to me, because I have never since been able to read Shakespeare in a calm and sane way. I cannot rid it of his explosive interlardings. They break in everywhere with their irrelevant, What in hell are you up to now? Pull her down! More! More! There now! Steady as you go! And the other disorganizing interruptions that were always leaping from his mouth. When I read Shakespeare now, I can hear them as plainly as I did in that long departed time fifty-one years ago. I never regarded Ealer's readings as educational. Indeed, they were a detriment to me. His contributions to the text seldom improved it, but barring that detail he was a good reader. I can say that much for him. He did not use the book and did not need to. He knew his Shakespeare as well as Euclid ever knew his multiplication table. Did he have something to say, this Shakespeare-adoring Mississippi pilot? anent Delia Bacon's book? Yes, and he said it, said it all the time, for months, in the morning watch, the middle watch, and dog watch, and probably kept it going in his sleep. He bought the literature of the dispute as fast as it appeared, and we discussed it all through thirteen hundred miles of river, four times traversed in every thirty-five days, the time required by that swift boat to achieve two round trips. We discussed, and discussed, and discussed, and disputed, and disputed, and disputed. At any rate, he did, and I got in a word now and then when he slipped a cog and there was a vacancy. He did his arguing with heat, with energy, with violence, and I did mine with the reserve and moderation of a subordinate who does not like to be flung out of a pilot-house that is perched forty feet above the water. He was fiercely loyal to Shakespeare, and cordially scornful of Bacon, and of all the pretensions of the Baconians. So was I, at first. And at first he was glad that that was my attitude. There were even indications that he admired it, 
indications dimmed it is true by the distance that lay between the lofty boss pilotical altitude and my lowly one yet perceptible to me perceptible and translatable into a compliment compliment coming down from above the snow line and not well thought in the transit and not likely to set anything afire not even a cub pilot's self-conceit still a detectable compliment and precious naturally it flattered me into being more loyal to shakespeare if possible than i was before and more prejudiced against bacon if possible than i was before and so we discussed and discussed both on the same side and were happy for a while only for a while only for a very little while a very 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 little while then the atmosphere began to change began to cool off a brighter person would have seen what the trouble was earlier than i did perhaps but i saw it early enough for all practical purposes you see he was of an argumentative disposition therefore it took him but a little time to get tired of arguing with a person who agreed with everything he said and consequently never furnished him a provocative to flare up and show what he could do when it came to clear cold hard rose-cut hundred-faceted diamond-flashing reasoning that was his name for it it has been applied since with complacency as many as several times in the bacon shakespeare scuffle on the shakespeare side then the thing happened which has happened to more persons than to me when principle and personal interest found themselves in opposition to each other and a choice had to be made i let principle go and went over to the other side not the entire way but far enough to answer the requirements of the case that is to say i took this attitude to it i only believed bacon wrote shakespeare whereas i knew shakespeare didn't ehler was satisfied with that and the war broke loose study practice experience in handling my end of the matter presently enabled me to take my new position almost seriously a little bit later utterly seriously a little later still lovingly gratefully devotedly finally fiercely rabidly uncompromisingly after that i was welded to my faith i was theoretically ready to die for it and i looked down with compassion not unmixed with scorn upon everybody else's faith that didn't tally with mine that faith imposed upon me by self-interest in that ancient day remains my faith to-day and in it i find comfort solace peace and never-failing joy you see how curiously theological it is the rice christian of the orient goes through the very same steps when he is after rice and the missionary is after him he goes for rice and remains to worship ehler did a lot of our reasoning not to say substantially all of it the slaves of his cult have a passion for calling it by that large name we others do not call our inductions and deductions and reductions by any name at all they show for themselves what they are and we can with tranquil confidence leave the world to ennoble them with a title of its own choosing now and then when ehler had to stop to cough i pulled my induction talents together and hove the controversial lead myself always getting eight feet eight and a half often nine sometimes even quarter less twain as i believed but always no bottom as he said i got the best of him only once i prepared myself i wrote out a passage from shakespeare it may have been the very one i quoted a while ago i don't remember and riddled it with his wild steamboatful interlardings when an unrisky opportunity offered one lovely summer day when we had sounded and buoyed a tangled patch of crossings known as hell's half acre and were aboard again and he had sneaked the pennsylvania triumphantly through it without once scraping sand and the a t lacy had followed in our wake and got stuck and he was feeling good i showed it to him it amused him i asked him to fire it off read it read it i diplomatically added as only he could read dramatic poetry the compliment touched him where he lived he did read it read it with surpassing fire and spirit 
read it as it will never be read again for he knew how to put the right music into those thunderous interlardings and make them seem a part of the text make them sound as if they were bursting from shakespeare's own soul each one of them a golden inspiration and not to be left out without damage to the mast and magnificent whole i waited a week to let the incident fade waited longer waited until he brought up for reasonings and vituperation my pet position my pet argument the one which i was fondest of the one which i prized far above all others in my ammunition wagon to wit that shakespeare couldn't have written shakespeare's works for the reason that the man who wrote them was limitlessly familiar with the laws and the law courts and law proceedings and lawyer talk and lawyer ways and if shakespeare was possessed of the infinitely divided stardust that constituted this vast wealth how did he get it and where and when from books from books that was always the idea i answered as my readings of the champions of my side of the great controversy had taught me to answer that a man can't handle glibly and easily and comfortably and successfully the argot of a trade at which he has not personally served he will make mistakes he will not and cannot get the trade phrasings precisely and exactly right and the moment he departs by even a shade from a common trade form the reader who has served that trade will know the writer hasn't ealer would not be convinced he said a man could learn how to correctly handle the subtleties and mysteries and freemasonries of any trade by careful reading and studying but when i got him to read again the passage from shakespeare with the interlardings he perceived himself that books couldn't teach a student a bewildering multitude of pilot phrases so thoroughly and perfectly that he could talk them off in a book and play or conversation and make no mistake that a pilot would not immediately discover it was a triumph for me he was silent a while and i knew what was happening he was losing his temper and i knew he would presently close the session with the same old argument that was always his stay and his support in time of need the same old argument the one i couldn't answer because i dasn't the argument that i was an ass and better shut up he delivered it and i obeyed oh dear how long ago it was how pathetically long ago and here i am old forsaken forlorn and alone arranging to get that argument out of somebody again when a man has a passion for shakespeare it goes without saying that he keeps company with other standard authors ealer always had several high-class books in the pilot-house and he read the same ones over and over again and did not care to change to newer and fresher ones he played well on the flute and greatly enjoyed hearing himself play so did i he had a notion that a flute would keep its health better if you took it apart when it was not standing a watch and so when it was not on duty it took its rest disjointed on the compass shelf under the breastboard when the pennsylvania blew up and became a drifting rack heap freighted with wounded and dying poor souls my young brother henry among them pilot brown had the watch below and was probably asleep and never knew what killed him but ealer escaped unhurt he and his pilot-house were shot up into the air then they fell and ealer sank through the ragged cavern where the hurricane deck and the boiler deck had been and landed in a nest of ruins on the main deck on top of one of the unexploded boilers where he lay prone in a fog of scald and deadly steam but not for long he did not lose his head long familiarity with danger had taught him to keep it in any and all emergencies he held his coat lapels to his nose with one hand to keep out the steam and scrabbled around with the other till he found the joints of his flute then he took measures to save himself alive and was successful i was not on board i had been put ashore in new orleans by captain kleinfelter the reason however i have told all about it in the book called old times on the mississippi and it isn't important anyway it is so long ago two 
When I was a Sunday school scholar, something more than sixty years ago, I became interested in Satan, and wanted to find out all I could about him. I began to ask questions, but my class teacher, Mr. Barclay, the stonemason, was reluctant about answering them, it seemed to me. I was anxious to be praised for turning my thoughts to serious subjects when there wasn't another boy in the village who could be hired to do such a thing. I was greatly interested in the incident of Eve and the serpent, and thought Eve's calmness was perfectly noble. I asked Mr. Barclay if he had ever heard of another woman who, being approached by a serpent, would not excuse herself and break for the nearest timber. He did not answer my question, but rebuked me for inquiring into matters above my age and comprehension. I will say for Mr. Barclay that he was willing to tell me the facts of Satan's history, but he stopped there. He wouldn't allow any discussion of them. In the course of time we exhausted the facts. There were only five or six of them. You could set them all down on a visiting card. I was disappointed. I had been meditating a biography, and was grieved to find that there were no materials. I said as much, with the tears running down. Mr. Barclay's sympathy and compassion were aroused, for he was a most kind and gentle-spirited man, and he patted me on the head, and cheered me up by saying there was a whole vast ocean of materials. I can still feel the happy thrill which these blessed words shot through me. Then he began to bail out that ocean's riches for my encouragement and joy. Like this. It was conjectured, though not established, that Satan was originally an angel in heaven, that he fell, that he rebelled and brought on a war, that he was defeated and banished to perdition. Also, we have reason to believe that later he did so-and-so, that we are warranted in supposing that at a subsequent time he traveled extensively, seeking whom he might devour, that a couple of centuries afterward, as tradition instructs us, he took up the cruel trade of tempting people to their ruin, with vast and fearful results, that by and by, as the probabilities seem to indicate, he may have done certain things, he might have done certain other things, he must have done still other things, and so on and so on. We set down the five known facts by themselves on a piece of paper and numbered it page one. Then on fifteen hundred other pieces of paper we set down the conjectures and suppositions and maybes and perhapses and doubtlesses and rumors and guesses and probabilities and likelihoods and we are permitted to thinks and we are warranted in believings and might have beens and could have beens and must have beens and unquestionablys and without a shadow of doubts and behold materials why we had enough to build a biography of shakespeare yet he made me put away my pen he would not let me write the history of satan why because as he said he had suspicions suspicions that my attitude in that matter was not reverent and that a person must be reverent when writing about the sacred characters he said any one who spoke flippantly of satan would be frowned upon by the religious world and also be brought to account. I assured him in earnest and sincere words that he had wholly misconceived my attitude, that I had the highest respect for Satan, and that my reverence for him equaled and possibly even exceeded that of any member of any church. I said it wounded me deeply to perceive by his words that he thought I would make fun of Satan, and deride him, laugh at him, scoff at him, whereas in truth I had never thought of such a thing but had only a warm desire to make fun of those others and laugh at them. What others? Why, the supposers, the perhapsers, the might-have-beeners, the could-have-beeners, the must-have-beeners, the without-a-shadow-of-doubters, the we-are-warranted-in-believingers, and all that funny crop of solemn architects who have taken a good solid foundation of five indisputable and unimportant facts and built upon it a conjectural Satan thirty miles high. What did Mr. Barclay do then? Was he disarmed? 
was he silenced no he was shocked he was so shocked that he visibly shuddered he said the satanic traditioners and perhapsers and conjecturers were themselves sacred as sacred as their work so sacred that whoso ventured to mock them or make fun of their work could not afterward enter any respectable house even by the back door how true were his words and how wise how fortunate it would have been for me if i had heeded them but i was young i was but seven years of age and vain foolish and anxious to attract attention i wrote the biography and have never been in a respectable house since three how curious and interesting is the parallel as far as poverty of biographical details is concerned between satan and shakespeare it is wonderful it is unique it stands quite alone there is nothing resembling it in history nothing resembling it in romance nothing approaching it even in tradition how sublime is their position and how overtopping how sky-reaching how supreme the two great unknowns the two illustrious conjectural abilities they are the best-known unknown persons that have ever drawn breath upon the planet for the instruction of the ignorant i will make a list now of those details of shakespeare's history which are facts verified facts established facts undisputed facts facts he was born on the twenty third of april fifteen sixty four of good farmer-class parents who could not read could not write could not sign their names at stratford a small back settlement which in that day was shabby and unclean and densely illiterate of the nineteen important men charged with the government of the town thirteen had to make their mark in attesting important documents because they could not write their names of the first eighteen years of his life nothing is known they are a blank on the twenty seventh of november fifteen eighty two William Shakespeare took out a license to marry Anne Waitley. Next day William Shakespeare took out a license to marry Anne Hathaway. She was eight years his senior. William Shakespeare married Anne Hathaway. In a hurry. By grace of a reluctantly granted dispensation there was but one publication of the bands. Within six months the first child was born. About two blank, years followed during which period nothing at all happened to Shakespeare, so far as anybody knows. Then came twins, 1585, February. Two blank years follow. Then, 1587, he makes a ten-year visit to London, leaving the family behind. Five blank years follow. During this period, nothing happened to him, as far as anybody actually knows. Then, 1592, there is mention of him as an actor. Next year, 1593, his name appears in the official list of players. Next year, 1594, he played before the Queen. A detail of no consequence. Other obscurities did it every year of the forty-five of her reign, and remained obscure. Three pretty full years follow, full of play-acting. Then, in 1597 he bought new place stratford thirteen or fourteen busy years follow years in which he accumulated money and also reputation as actor and manager meantime his name liberally and variously spelt had become associated with a number of great plays and poems as ostensibly author of the same some of these in these years and later were pirated but he made no protest then, 1610-11, he returned to Stratford and settled down for good and all, and busied himself in lending money, trading in tithes, trading in land and houses, shirking a debt of forty-one shillings, borrowed by his wife during his long desertion of his family, suing debtors for shillings and coppers, being sued himself for shillings and coppers, and acting as confederate to a neighbor who tried to rob the town of its rights in a certain common and did not succeed. He lived five or six years, till 1616, in the joy of these elevated pursuits. Then he made a will, 
and signed each of its three pages with his name. A thoroughgoing businessman's will. It named in minute detail every item of property he owned in the world, houses, lands, sword, silver gilt bowl, and so on, all the way down to his second best bed and its furniture. It carefully and calculatingly distributed his riches among the members of his family, overlooking no individual of it, not even his wife, the wife he had been enabled to marry in a hurry by urgent grace of a special dispensation before he was nineteen, the wife whom he had left husbandless so many years, the wife who had had to borrow forty-one shillings in her need, and which the lender was never able to collect of the prosperous husband, but died at last with the money still lacking. No, even this wife was remembered in Shakespeare's will. He left her that second-best bed, and not another thing, not even a penny to bless her lucky widowhood with. It was eminently and conspicuously a businessman's will, not a poet's. It mentioned not a single book. Books were much more precious than swords and silver-gilt bowls and second-best beds in those days and when a departing person owned one, he gave it a high place in his will. The will mentioned not a play, not a poem, not an unfinished literary work, not a scrap of manuscript of any kind. Many poets have died poor, but this is the only one in history that has died this poor. The others all left literary remains behind, also a book, maybe two. If Shakespeare had owned a dog— but we need not go into that. We know he would have mentioned it in his will. If a good dog, Susanna would have got it. If an inferior one, his wife would have got a dour interest in it. I wish he had had a dog, just so we could see how painstakingly he would have divided the dog among the family, in his careful business way. He signed the will in three places. In earlier years he signed two other official documents— these five signatures still exist. There are no other specimens of his penmanship in existence, not a line. Was he prejudiced against the art? His granddaughter, whom he loved, was eight years old when he died, yet she had had no teaching. He left no provision for her education, although he was rich, and in her mature womanhood she couldn't write and couldn't tell her husband's manuscript from anybody else's. She thought it was Shakespeare's. When Shakespeare died in Stratford, it was not an event. It made no more stir in England than the death of any other forgotten theatre actor would have made. Nobody came down from London. There were no lamenting poems, no eulogies, no national tears. There was merely silence, and nothing more. A striking contrast with what happened when Ben Jonson and Francis Bacon and Spencer, and Raleigh, and the other distinguished literary folk of Shakespeare's time passed from life. No praiseful voice was lifted for the lost bard of Avon. Even Ben Jonson waited seven years before he lifted his. So far as anybody actually knows and can prove, Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon never wrote a play in his life. So far as anybody knows and can prove, he never wrote a letter to anybody in his life. So far as anyone knows, he received only one letter during his life. So far as anyone knows and can prove, Shakespeare of Stratford wrote only one poem during his life. This one is authentic. He did write that one, a fact which stands undisputed. He wrote the whole of it. He wrote the whole of it out of his own head. He commanded that this work of art be engraved upon his tomb, and he was obeyed. There it abides to this day. This is it. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be ye man, yet spares these stones, and cursed be he, yet moves my bones. In the list, as above set down, will be found every positively known fact of Shakespeare's life, lean and meager as the invoice is. Beyond these details we know not a thing about him. 
all the rest of his vast history, as furnished by the biographers, is built up, course upon course, of guesses, inferences, theories, conjectures, an Eiffel Tower of artificialities rising sky-high from a very flat and very thin foundation of inconsequential facts. End of section 22, parts 1 through 3 of Is Shakespeare Dead? This is section 23 of What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Is Shakespeare Dead? Section 4 through 7. 4. Conjectures. The historians suppose that Shakespeare attended the free school in Stratford from the time he was seven years old till he was thirteen. There is no evidence in existence that he ever went to school at all. The historians infer that he got his Latin in that school, the school which they suppose he attended. They suppose his father's declining fortunes made it necessary for him to leave the school they supposed he attended, and get to work and help support his parents and their ten children. But there is no evidence that he ever attended or returned from the school they suppose he attended. They suppose he assisted his father in the butchering business, and that, being only a boy, he didn't have to do full-grown butchering, but only slaughtered calves. Also, that whenever he killed a calf, he made a high-flown speech over it. This supposition rests upon the testimony of a man who wasn't there at the time, a man who got it from a man who could have been there, but did not say whether he was or not, and neither of them thought to mention it for decades, and decades, and decades, and two more decades after Shakespeare's death, until old age and mental decay had refreshed and vivified their memories. They hadn't two facts in stock about the long-dead distinguished citizen, but only just the one. He slaughtered calves and broke into oratory while he was at it. Curious. They had only one fact— Yet the distinguished citizen had spent twenty-six years in that little town, just half his lifetime. However, rightly viewed, it was the most important fact, indeed almost the only important fact, of Shakespeare's life in Stratford. Rightly viewed. For experience is an author's most valuable asset. Experience is the thing that puts the muscle and the breath and the warm blood into the book he writes. Rightly viewed, Calf butchering accounts for Titus Andronicus, the only play, ain't it, that the Stratford Shakespeare ever wrote. And yet, it is the only one everybody tried to chouse him out of, the Baconians included. The historians find themselves justified in believing that the young Shakespeare poached upon Sir Thomas Lucy's deer preserves and got hailed before that magistrate for it. But there is no shred of respectworthy evidence that anything of the kind happened. The historians, having argued the thing that might have happened into the thing that did happen, found no trouble in turning Sir Thomas Lucy into Mr. Justice Shallow. They have long ago convinced the world, on surmise and without trustworthy evidence, that Shallow is Sir Thomas. The next addition to the young Shakespeare's Stratford history comes easy— the historian builds it out of the surmised deer-stealing, and the surmised trial before the magistrate, and the surmised vengeance-prompted satire upon the magistrate in the play. Result? The young Shakespeare was a wild, 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 oh, such a wild young scamp, and that gratuitous slander is established for all time. It is the very way Professor Osborne and I built the colossal skeleton brontosaur that stands fifty-seven feet long and sixteen feet high in the National History Museum, the awe and admiration of all the world, the stateliest skeleton that exists on the planet. We had nine bones, and we built the rest of him out of plaster of Paris. We ran short of plaster of Paris, or we'd have built a brontosaur that could sit down beside the Stratford Shakespeare, and none but an expert could tell which was biggest or contained the most plaster. Shakespeare pronounced Venus and Adonis, the first heir of his invention, apparently implying that it was his first effort at literary composition. 
he should not have said it. It has been an embarrassment to his historians these many, many years. They have to make him write that graceful and polished and flawless and beautiful poem before he escaped from Stratford and his family, 1586 or 87, age 22 or along there, because within the next five years he wrote five great plays and could not have found time to write another line. It is sorely embarrassing. If he began to slaughter calves and poach deer and rollick around and learn English at the earliest likely moment, say at thirteen, when he was supposedly wrenched from that school where he was supposedly storing up Latin for future literary use, he had his youthful hands full and much more than full. He must have had to put aside his Warwickshire dialect, which wouldn't be understood in London, and study English very hard very hard indeed incredibly hard almost if the result of that labor was to be the smooth and rounded and flexible and letter-perfect english of the venus and adonis in the space of ten years and at the same time learn great and fine and unsurpassable literary form however it is conjectured that he accomplished all this and more much more learned law and its intricacies and the complex procedure of the law courts, and all about soldiering and sailoring, and the manners and customs and ways of royal courts and aristocratic society, and likewise accumulated in his one head every kind of knowledge the learned then possessed, and every kind of humble knowledge possessed by the lowly and the ignorant, and added thereto a wider and more intimate knowledge of the world's great literatures, ancient and modern, than was possessed by any other man of his time. For he was going to make brilliant and easy and admiration-compelling use of these splendid treasures the moment he got to London. And according to the surmisers, that is what he did. Yes, although there was no one in Stratford able to teach him these things, and no library in the little village to dig them out of. His father could not read, and even the surmisers surmised that he did not keep a library. It is surmised by the biographers that the young Shakespeare got his vast knowledge of the law and his familiar and accurate acquaintance with the manners and customs and shop-talk of lawyers through being, for a time, the clerk of a Stratford court. Just as a bright lad like me, reared in a village on the banks of the Mississippi, might become perfect in knowledge of the bearing straight whale fishery and the shop-talk of the veteran exercises of that adventure-bristling trade through catching catfish with a trot-line Sundays. But the surmise is damaged by the fact that there is no evidence, and not even tradition, that the young Shakespeare was ever clerk of a law court. It is further surmised that the young Shakespeare accumulated his law treasures in the first years of his sojourn in London, through amusing himself by learning book law in his garret, and by picking up lawyer talk and the rest of it, through loitering about the law courts and listening. But it is only surmise. There is no evidence that he ever did either of those things. They are merely a couple of chunks of plaster of Paris. There is a legend that he got his bread and butter by holding horses in front of the London theatres, mornings and afternoons. Maybe he did. If he did, it seriously shortened his law-study hours and his recreation time in the courts. In those very days he was writing great plays, and needed all the time he could get. The horse-holding legend ought to be strangled. It, too, formidably increases the historian's difficulty in accounting for the young Shakespeare's erudition an erudition which he was acquiring, hunk by hunk and chunk by chunk, every day in those strenuous times, and emptying each day's catch into next day's imperishable drama. He had to acquire a knowledge of war at the same time, and a knowledge of soldier people and sailor people and their ways and talk, also a knowledge of some foreign lands and their languages, for he was daily emptying fluent streams of these various knowledges, too, into his dramas. How did he acquire these rich assets? In the usual way, by surmise. It is surmised that he traveled in Italy and Germany and around, and qualified himself to put their scenic and social aspects upon paper, that he perfected himself in French, Italian, and Spanish on the road, 
that he went in Leicester's expedition to the Low Countries as soldier or sutler or something for several months or years, or whatever length of time a surmiser needs in his business, and thus became familiar with soldiership and soldier ways and soldier talk and generalship and general ways and general talk and seamanship and sailor ways and sailor talk. Maybe he did all these things, but I would like to know who held the horses in the meantime and who studied the books in the garret, and who frolicked in the law courts for recreation. Also, who did the call-boying and the play-acting? For he became a call-boy, and as early as ninety-three he became a vagabond, the law's ungentle term for an unlisted actor, and in ninety-four a regular and properly and officially listed member of that in those days lightly valued and not much respected profession right soon thereafter he became a stockholder in two theatres and manager of them thenceforward he was a busy and flourishing business man and was raking in money with both hands for twenty years then in a noble frenzy of poetic inspiration he wrote his one poem his only poem his darling and laid him down and died good friends for jesus sake forbear to dig the dust and closed hair blessed be ye man yet spares these stones and cursed be he it moves my bones he was probably dead when he wrote it still this is only conjecture we have only circumstantial evidence internal evidence shall i set down the rest of the conjectures which constitute the giant biography of william shakespeare it would strain the unabridged dictionary to hold them he is a brontosaur nine bones and six hundred barrels of plaster of paris five we may assume in the assuming trade three separate and independent cults are transacting business Two of these cults are known as the Shakespeareites and the Baconians, and I am the other one, the Brontosaurian. The Shakespeareite knows that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare's works. The Baconian knows that Francis Bacon wrote them. The Brontosaurian doesn't really know which of them did it, but is quite composedly and contentedly sure that Shakespeare didn't, and strongly suspects that Bacon did. We all have to do a good deal of assuming but i am fairly certain that in every case i can call to mind the baconian assumers have come out ahead of the shakespeareites both parties handle the same materials but the baconians seem to me to get much more reasonable and rational and persuasive results out of them than is the case with the shakespeareites the shakespeareite conducts his assuming upon a definite principle an unchanging and immutable law which is two and eight and seven and fourteen added together make one hundred and sixty-five i believe this to be an error no matter you cannot get a habit-sodden shakespeareite to cipher up his materials upon any other basis with a baconian it is different if you place before him the above figures and set him to adding them up he will never in any case get more than forty-five out of them and in nine cases out of ten he will get just the proper thirty-one. Let me try to illustrate the two systems in a simple and homely way calculated to bring the idea within the grasp of the ignorant and unintelligent. We will suppose a case. Take a lap-bred, house-fed, uneducated, inexperienced kitten. Take a rugged old tom that's scarred from stem to rudder-post with the memorials of strenuous experience, and is so cultured, so educated, so limitlessly erudite that one may say of him all cat knowledge is his province also take a mouse lock the three up in a holeless crackless exitless prison cell wait half an hour then open the cell introduce a shakespeareite and a baconian and let them cipher and assume the mouse is missing the question to be decided is where is it you can guess both verdicts beforehand. One verdict will say, The kitten contains the mouse. The other will as certainly say, The mouse is in the tomcat. The Shakespeareite will reason like this. That is not my word, it is his. He will say, The kitten 
may have been attending school when nobody was noticing therefore we are warranted in assuming that it did so also it could have been training in a court clerk's office when no one was noticing since that could have happened we are justified in assuming that it did happen it could have studied catology in a garret when no one was noticing therefore it did it could have attended catechizes on the shed roof nights for recreation when no one was noticing and have harvested a knowledge of cat court forms and cat lawyer talk in that way it could have done it therefore without a doubt it did it could have gone soldiering with a war tribe when no one was noticing and learned soldier wiles and soldier ways and what to do with a mouse when opportunity offers the plain inference therefore is that that is what it did since all these manifold things could have occurred we have every right to believe they did occur these patiently and painstakingly accumulated vast acquirements and competences needed but one thing more opportunity to convert themselves into triumphant action the opportunity came we have the result beyond shadow of question the mouse is in the kitten it is proper to remark that when we of the three cults plant a we think we may assume we expect it under careful watering and fertilizing and tending to grow up into a strong and hardy and weather defying there isn't a shadow of a doubt at last and it usually happens we know what the baconian's verdict would be there is not a rag of evidence that the kitten has had any training any education any experience qualifying it for the present occasion or is indeed equipped for any achievement above lifting such unclaimed milk as comes its way but there is abundant evidence unassailable proof in fact that the other animal is equipped to the last detail with every qualification necessary for the event without shadow of doubt the tomcat contains the mouse six when shakespeare died in sixteen sixteen great literary productions attributed to him as author had been before the london world and in high favor for twenty-four years yet his death was not an event it made no stir it attracted no attention apparently his eminent literary contemporaries did not realize that a celebrated poet had passed from their midst perhaps they knew a play-actor of minor rank had disappeared but did not regard him as the author of his works we are justified in assuming this his death was not even an event in the little town of stratford does this mean that in stratford he was not regarded as a celebrity of any kind we are privileged to assume no we are indeed obliged to assume that such was the case he had spent the first twenty-two or twenty-three years of his life there and of course knew everybody and was known by everybody of that day in the town including the dogs and the cats and the horses he had spent the last five or six years of his life there diligently trading in every big and little thing that had money in it so we are compelled to assume that many of the folk there in those said latter days knew him personally and the rest by sight and hearsay but not as a celebrity apparently not for everybody soon forgot to remember any contact with him or any incident connected with him the dozens of townspeople still alive who had known of him or known about him in the first twenty-three years of his life were in the same unremembering condition if they knew of any incident connected with that period of his life they didn't tell about it would they if they had been asked it is most likely were they asked it is pretty apparent that they were not why weren't they it is a very plausible guess that nobody there or elsewhere was interested to know for seven years after shakespeare's death nobody seems to have been interested in him then the quarto was published and ben jonson awoke out of his long indifference and sang a song of praise and put it in the front of the book then silence fell again for sixty years then inquiries into shakespeare's stratford life began to be made of stratfordians 
of stratfordians who had known shakespeare or had seen him no then of stratfordians who had seen people who had known or seen people who had seen shakespeare no apparently the inquiries were only made of stratfordians who were not stratfordians of shakespeare's day but later comers and what they had learned had come to them from persons who had not seen shakespeare and what they had learned was not claimed as fact but only as legend dim and fading and indefinite legend legend of the calf slaughtering rank and not worth remembering either as history or fiction has it ever happened before or since that a celebrated person who had spent exactly half of a fairly long life in the village where he was born and reared was able to slip out of this world and leave that village voiceless and gossipless behind him utterly voiceless utterly gossipless and permanently so i don't believe it has happened in any case except shakespeare's and couldn't and wouldn't have happened in his case if he had been regarded as a celebrity at the time of his death when i examine my own case but let us do that and see if it will not be recognizable as exhibiting a condition of things quite likely to result most likely to result indeed substantially sure to result in the case of a celebrated person a benefactor of the human race like me my parents brought me to the village of hannibal missouri on the banks of the mississippi when i was two and a half years old i entered school at five years of age and drifted from one school to another in the village during nine and a half years then my father died leaving his family in exceedingly straitened circumstances wherefore my book education came to a standstill forever and i became a printer's apprentice on board and clothes and when the clothes failed i got a hymn book in place of them this for summer wear probably i lived in hannibal fifteen and a half years altogether then ran away according to the custom of persons who are intending to become celebrated i never lived there afterward four years later i became a cub on a mississippi steamboat in the st louis and new orleans trade and after a year and a half of hard study and hard work the u s inspectors rigorously examined me through a couple of long sittings and decided that i knew every inch of the mississippi thirteen hundred miles in the dark and in the day as well as a baby knows the way to its mother's paps day or night so they licensed me as a pilot knighted me so to speak and i rose up clothed with authority a responsible servant of the united states government now then shakespeare died young he was only fifty-two he had lived in his native village twenty-six years or about that he died celebrated if you believe everything you read in the books yet when he died nobody there or elsewhere took any notice of it and for sixty years afterward no townsman remembered to say anything about him or about his life in stratford when the inquirer came at last he got but one fact no legend and got that one at second hand from a person who had only heard it as a rumor and didn't claim copyright in it as a production of his own he couldn't very well for its date antedated his own birth date but necessarily a number of persons were still alive in stratford who in the days of their youth had seen shakespeare nearly every day in the last five years of his life and they would have been able to tell that inquirer some first-hand things about him if he had in those last days been a celebrity and therefore a person of interest to the villagers why did not the inquirer hunt them up and interview them wasn't it worth while wasn't the matter of sufficient consequence had the inquirer an engagement to see a dog-fight and couldn't spare the time it all seems to mean that he never had any literary celebrity there or elsewhere and no considerable repute as actor and manager now then i am away along in life my seventy-third year being already well behind me yet sixteen of my hannibal schoolmates are still alive to-day and can tell and do tell inquirers dozens and dozens of incidents of their young lives and mine together things that happened to us in the morning of life in the blossom of our youth in the good days the dear days the days we went gypsying a long time ago most of them creditable to me too one child to whom i paid court when she was five years old and i eight still lives in hannibal and she visited me last summer 
traversing the necessary ten or twelve hundred miles of railroad without damage to her patience or to her old young vigor another little lassie to whom i paid attention in hannibal when she was nine years old and i the same is still alive in london and hale and hearty just as i am and on the few surviving steamboats those lingering ghosts and remembrancers of great fleets that plied the big river in the beginning of my water career which is exactly as long ago as the whole invoice of the life-years of shakespeare numbers there are still findable two or three river pilots who saw me do credible things in those ancient days and several white-headed engineers and several roustabouts and mates and several deckhands who used to heave the lead for me and send up on the still night the six feet scant that made me shudder and the mark twain that took the shudder away and presently the darling by the deep four that lifted me to heaven for joy note one four fathoms twenty four feet they know about me and can tell and so do printers from st louis to new york and so do newspaper reporters from nevada to san francisco and so do the police if shakespeare had really been celebrated like me stratford could have told things about him and if my experience goes for anything they'd have done it seven if i had under my superintendence a controversy appointed to decide whether shakespeare wrote shakespeare or not i believe i would place before the debaters only the one question was shakespeare ever a practicing lawyer and leave everything else out it is maintained that the man who wrote the plays was not merely myriad-minded but also myriad accomplished that he not only knew some thousands of things about human life in all its shades and grades and about the hundred arts and trades and crafts and professions which men busy themselves in but that he could talk about the men and their grades and trades accurately making no mistakes maybe it is so but have the experts spoken or is it only tom dick and harry does the exhibit stand upon wide and loose and eloquent generalizing which is not evidence and not proof or upon details particulars statistics illustrations demonstrations experts of unchallengeable authority have testified definitely as to only one of shakespeare's multifarious craft equipments so far as my recollections of shakespeare bacon talk abide with me his law equipment i do not remember that wellington or napoleon ever examined shakespeare's battles and sieges and strategies and then decided and established for good and all that they were militarily flawless i do not remember that any nelson or drake or cook ever examined his seamanship and said it showed profound and accurate familiarity with that art i don't remember that any king or prince or duke has ever testified that shakespeare was letter perfect in his handling of royal court manners and the talk and manners of aristocracies i don't remember that any illustrious latinist or grecian or frenchman or spaniard or italian has proclaimed him a past master in those languages i don't remember well i don't remember that there is testimony great testimony imposing testimony unanswerable and unattackable testimony as to any of shakespeare's hundred specialties except one the law other things change with time and the student cannot trace back with certainty the changes that various trades and their processes and technicalities have undergone in the long stretch of a century or two and find out what their processes and technicalities were in those early days but with the law it is different it is milestoned and documented all the way back and the master of that wonderful trade that complex and intricate trade that awe-compelling trade has competent ways of knowing whether shakespeare law is good law or not and whether his law court procedure is correct or not and whether his legal shop talk is the shop talk of a veteran practitioner or only a machine-made counterfeit of it gathered from books and from occasional loiterings in westminster richard h dana served two years before the mast and had every experience that falls to the lot of the sailor before the mast of our day 
his sailor talk flows from his pen with the sure touch and the ease and confidence of a person who has lived what he is talking about not gathered it from books and random listenings hear him having hove short cast off the gaskets and made the bunt of each sail fast by the jigger with a man on each yard at the word the whole canvas of the ship was loosed and with the greatest rapidity possible everything was sheeted home and hoisted up the anchor tripped and cat-headed and the ship under headway again the royal yards were all crossed at once and royals and skysails set and as we had the wind free the booms were run out and all were aloft active as cats laying out on the yards and booms reeving the studding sail gear and sail after sail the captain piled upon her until she was covered with canvas her sails looking like a great white cloud resting upon a black speck once more a race in the pacific our antagonist was in her best trim being clear of the point the breeze became stiff and the royal mass bent under our sails but we would not take them in until we saw three boys spring into the rigging of the california then they were all furled at once but with orders to our boys to stay aloft at the top-gallant mastheads and loose them again at the word. It was my duty to furl the foreroyal, and while standing by to loose it again I had a fine view of the scene. From where I stood the two vessels seemed nothing but spars and sails, while their narrow decks far below, slanting over by the force of the wind aloft, appeared hardly capable of supporting the great fabrics raised upon them the california was to windward of us and had every advantage yet while the breeze was stiff we held our own as soon as it began to slacken she ranged a little ahead and the order was given to loose the royals in an instant the gaskets were off and the bunt dropped sheet home the fore royal weather sheets home lee sheets home hoist away sir is bawled from aloft overhaul your clue lines shouts the mate aye aye sir all clear taut leech belay well the lee brace haul taut to windward and the royals are set what would the captain of any sailing vessel of our time say to that he would say the man that wrote that didn't learn his trade out of a book he has been there but would this same captain be competent to sit in judgment upon shakespeare's seamanship considering the changes in ships and ship talk that have necessarily taken place unrecorded unremembered and lost to history in the last three hundred years it is my conviction that shakespeare's sailor talk would be choctaw to him for instance from the tempest master boatswain boatswain here master what cheer master good speak to the mariners fall to it yarly or we run ourselves to ground bestir bestir enter mariners boatswain hey my hearts cheerly cheerly my hearts yar yar take in the top sail tend to the master's whistle down with the top mast yar lower lower bring her to try with the main course lay her a hold a hold set her two courses off to sea again lay her off that will do for the present let us yar a little now for a change if a man should write a book and in it make one of his characters say here devil empty the coins into the standing galley and the imposing stone into the hell box assemble the comps around the frisket and let them jeff for takes and be quick about it i should recognize a mistake or two in the phrasing and would know that the writer was only a printer theoretically and not practically i have been a quartz miner in the silver regions a pretty hard life i know all the palaver of that business I know all about discovery claims and the subordinate claims. I know all about loads, ledges, outcroppings, dips, spurs, angles, shafts, drifts, inclines, levels, tunnels, air shafts, horses, clay casings, granite casings, quartz mills and their batteries, arastras and how to charge them with quicksilver and sulfate of copper, and how to clean them up and how to reduce the resulting amalgam in the retorts, and how to cast the bullion into pigs, and finally I know how to screen tailings, and also how to hunt for something less robust to do and find it. I know the argot of the quartz mining and milling industry familiarly. 
and so whenever bret harte introduces that industry into a story the first time one of his miners opens his mouth i recognize from his phrasing that harte got the phrasing by listening like shakespeare i mean the stratford one not by experience no one can talk the court's dialect correctly without learning it with pick and shovel and drill and fuse i have been a surface miner gold and i know all its mysteries and the dialect that belongs with them and whenever hart introduces that industry into a story i know by the phrasing of his characters that neither he nor they have ever served that trade i have been a pocket miner a sort of gold mining not findable in any but one little spot in the world so far as i know i know how with horn and water to find the trail of a pocket and trace it step by step and stage by stage up the mountain to its source and find the compact little nest of yellow metal reposing in its secret home under the ground i know the language of that trade that capricious trade that fascinating buried treasure trade and can catch any writer who tries to use it without having learned it by the sweat of his brow and the labor of his hands i know several other trades and the argot that goes with them and whenever a person tries to talk the talk peculiar to any of them without having learned it at its source i can trap him always before he gets far on his road and so as i have already remarked if i were required to superintend a bacon shakespeare controversy i would narrow the matter down to a single question the only one so far as the previous controversies have informed me concerning which illustrious experts of unimpeachable competency have testified was the author of shakespeare's works a lawyer a lawyer deeply read and of limitless experience i would put aside the guesses and surmises and perhapses and might have beens and could have beens and must have beens and we are justified in presumings and the rest of those vague spectres and shadows and indefinitenesses and stand or fall win or lose by the verdict rendered by the jury upon that single question if the verdict was yes i should feel quite convinced that the stratford shakespeare the actor manager and trader who died so obscure so forgotten so destitute of even village consequence that sixty years afterward no fellow citizen and friend of this later days remember to tell anything about him did not write the works chapter thirteen of the shakespeare problem restated bears the heading shakespeare as a lawyer and comprises some fifty pages of expert testimony with comments thereon and i will copy the first nine as being sufficient all by themselves as it seems to me to settle the question which i have conceived to be the master key to the shakespeare bacon puzzle End of section 23This is section 24 of What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Is Shakespeare Dead? Parts 8 and 9. 8. Shakespeare as a Lawyer. Note 1. From Chapter 13 of The Shakespeare Problem Restated by George G. Greenwood, M.P., John Lane Company Publishers. The plays and poems of Shakespeare supply ample evidence that their author not only had a very extensive and accurate knowledge of law, but that he was well acquainted with the manners and customs of members of the inns of court and with legal life generally. While novelists and dramatists are constantly making mistakes as to the laws of marriage, of wills, and inheritance, to Shakespeare's law, lavishly as he expounds it, there can neither be demurrer, nor bill of exceptions, nor writ of error. Such was the testimony borne by one of the most distinguished lawyers of the nineteenth century who was raised to the high office of Lord Chief Justice in 1850, and subsequently became Lord Chancellor. Its weight will, doubtless, be more appreciated by lawyers than by laymen, for only lawyers know how impossible it is for those who have not served an apprenticeship to the law to avoid displaying their ignorance if they venture to employ legal terms and to discuss legal doctrines. "'There is nothing so dangerous,' wrote Lord Campbell, "'as for one not of the craft 
to tamper with our Freemasonry. A layman is certain to betray himself by using some expression which a lawyer would never employ. Mr. Sidney Lee himself supplies us with an example of this. He writes, page 164, On February 15, 1609, Shakespeare obtained judgment from a jury against Addenbroke for the payment of number six and number one, five shillings, zero pennies, costs. Now a lawyer would never have spoken of obtaining judgment from a jury, for it is the function of a jury not to deliver judgment, which is the prerogative of the court, but to find a verdict on the facts. The error is, indeed, a venial one, but it is just one of those little things which at once enable a lawyer to know if the writer is a layman or one of the craft. But when a layman ventures to plunge deeply into legal subjects, he is naturally apt to make an exhibition of his incompetence. Let a non-professional man, however acute, writes Lord Campbell again, presume to talk law or to draw illustrations from legal science in discussing other subjects, and he will speedily fall into laughable absurdity. And what does the same high authority say about Shakespeare? He had a deep technical knowledge of the law, and an easy familiarity with some of the most abstruse proceedings in English jurisprudence. And again, whenever he indulges this propensity, he uniformly lays down good law. Of Henry the Fourth, Part Two, he says, If Lord Eldon could be supposed to have written the play, I do not see how he could be chargeable with having forgotten any of his law while writing it. Charles and Mary Cowden Clark speak of the marvelous intimacy which he displays with legal terms, his frequent adoption of them in illustration, and his curiously technical knowledge of their form and force. Malone himself, a lawyer, wrote, His knowledge of legal terms is not merely such as might be acquired by the casual observation of even his all-comprehending mind. It has the appearance of technical skill." Another lawyer and well-known Shakespearean, Richard Grant White, says, No dramatist of the time, not even Beaumont, who was the younger son of a judge of the common pleas, and who, after studying in the inns of court abandoned law for the drama, used legal phrases with Shakespeare's readiness and exactness. And the significance of this fact is heightened by another, that it is only to the language of the law that he exhibits this inclination." The phrases peculiar to other occupations serve him on rare occasions by way of description, comparison, or illustration, generally when something in the scene suggests them, but legal phrases flow from his pen as part of his vocabulary and parcel of his thought. Take the word purchase, for instance, which in ordinary use means to acquire by giving value but applies in law to all legal modes of obtaining property except by inheritance or descent, and in this peculiar sense the word occurs five times in Shakespeare's thirty-four plays, and only in one single instance in the fifty-four plays of Beaumont and Fletcher. It has been suggested that it was in attendance upon the courts in London that he picked up his legal vocabulary but this supposition not only fails to account for Shakespeare's peculiar freedom and exactness in the use of that phraseology, it does not even place him in the way of learning those terms his use of which is most remarkable, which are not such as he would have heard at ordinary proceedings at Nisi Prius, but such as refer to the tenure or transfer of real property, fine and recovery, statutes merchant, purchase, indenture, tenure, double voucher, fee simple, fee farm, remainder, reversion, forfeiture, etc. This conveyancer's jargon could not have been picked up by hanging round the courts of law in London two hundred and fifty years ago, when suits as to the title of real property were comparatively rare. And besides, Shakespeare uses his law just as freely in his first plays, written in his first London years, as in those produced at a later period, just as exactly, too, for the correctness and propriety with which these terms are introduced have compelled the admiration of a Chief Justice and a Lord Chancellor. Senator Davis wrote, 
we seem to have something more than a silist's temerity of indulgence in the terms of an unfamiliar art no legal solecisms will be found the abstrusest elements of the common law are impressed into a disciplined service over and over again where such knowledge is unexampled in writers unlearned in the law shakespeare appears in perfect possession of it in the law of real property its rules of tenure and descents its entails its fines and recoveries their vouchers and double vouchers in the procedure of the courts the method of bringing writs and arrests the nature of actions the rules of pleading the law of escapes and of contempt of court in the principles of evidence both technical and philosophical in the distinction between the temporal and spiritual tribunals in the law of attainder and forfeiture in the requisites of a valid marriage in the presumption of legitimacy in the learning of the law of prerogative in the inalienable character of the crown this mastership appears with surprising authority to all this testimony and there is much more which i have not cited may now be added that of a great lawyer of our own times viz sir james placed at wilde q c eighteen fifty five created a baron of the exchequer in eighteen sixty promoted to the post of judge ordinary and judge of the courts of probate and divorce in eighteen sixty three and better known to the world as lord penzance to which dignity he was raised in eighteen sixty nine lord penzance as all lawyers know and as the late mr inderwick k c has testified was one of the first legal authorities of his day famous for his remarkable grasp of legal principles and endowed by nature with a remarkable facility for marshalling facts and for a clear expression of his views lord penzance speaks of shakespeare's perfect familiarity with not only the principles axioms and maxims but the technicalities of english law a knowledge so perfect and intimate that he was never incorrect and never at fault the mode in which this knowledge was pressed into service on all occasions to express his meaning and illustrate his thoughts was quite unexampled he seems to have had a special pleasure in his complete and ready mastership of it in all its branches as manifested in the plays this legal knowledge and learning had therefore a special character which places it on a wholly different footing from the rest of the multifarious knowledge which is exhibited in page after page of the plays at every turn and point at which the author required a metaphor simile or illustration his mind ever turned first to the law he seems almost to have thought in legal phrases the commonest of legal expressions were ever at the end of his pen in description or illustration that he should have descanted in lawyer language when he had a forensic subject in hand such as shylock's bond was to be expected but the knowledge of law in shakespeare was exhibited in a far different manner it protruded itself on all occasions appropriate or inappropriate and mingled itself with strains of thought widely divergent from forensic subjects again to acquire a perfect familiarity with legal principles and an accurate and ready use of the technical terms and phrases not only of the conveyancer's office but of the pleader's chambers and the courts at westminster nothing short of employment in some career involving constant contact with legal questions and general legal work would be requisite but a continuous employment involves the element of time and time was just what the manager of two theatres had not at his disposal in what portion of shakespeare's i e shakespeare's with only one a career would it be possible to point out that time could be found for the interposition of a legal employment in the chambers or offices of practicing lawyers stratfordians as is well known casting about for some possible explanation of shakespeare's extraordinary knowledge of law have made the suggestion that shakespeare might conceivably have been a clerk in an attorney's office before he came to london mr collier wrote to lord campbell to ask his opinion as to the probability of this being true his answer was as follows you require us to believe implicitly a fact of which if true 
positive and irrefragable evidence in his own handwriting might have been forthcoming to establish it not having been actually enrolled as an attorney neither the records of the local court at stratford nor of the superior courts at westminster would present his name as being concerned in any suit as an attorney but it might reasonably have been expected that there would be deeds or wills witnessed by him still extant and after a very diligent search none such can be discovered upon this lord penzance comments it cannot be doubted that lord campbell was right in this no young man could have been at work in an attorney's office without being called upon continually to act as a witness and in many other ways leaving traces of his work and name there is not a single fact or incident in all that is known of shakespeare even by rumor or tradition which supports this notion of a clerkship and after much argument and surmise which has been indulged in on this subject we may i think safely put the notion on one side for no less an authority than mr grant white says finally that the idea of his having been clerk to an attorney has been blown to pieces it is altogether characteristic of mr churton collins that he nevertheless adopts this exploded myth that shakespeare was in early life employed as a clerk in an attorney's office may be correct at stratford there was by royal charter a court of record sitting every fortnight with six attorneys besides the town clerk belonging to it and it is certainly not straining probability to suppose that the young shakespeare may have had employment in one of them there is it is true no tradition to this effect but such traditions as we have about shakespeare's occupation between the time of leaving school and going to london are so loose and baseless that no confidence can be placed in them it is to say the least more probable that he was in an attorney's office than that he was a butcher killing calves in a high style and making speeches over them this is a charming specimen of stratfordian argument there is as we have seen a very old tradition that shakespeare was a butcher's apprentice john dowdle who made a tour in warwickshire in sixteen ninety three testifies to it as coming from the old clerk who showed him over the church and it is unhesitatingly accepted as true by mr hallowell phillips volume one page eleven and volume two pages seventy one seventy two mr sidney lee sees nothing improbable in it and it is supported by aubrey who must have written his account some time before sixteen eighty when his manuscript was completed of the attorney's clerk hypothesis on the other hand there is not the faintest vestige of a tradition it has been evolved out of the fertile imaginations of embarrassed stratfordians seeking for some explanation of the stratford rustic's marvelous acquaintance with law and legal terms and legal life but mr churton collins has not the least hesitation in throwing over the tradition which has the warrant of antiquity and setting up in its stead this ridiculous invention for which not only is there no shred of positive evidence but which as lord campbell and lord penzance point out is really put out of court by the negative evidence since no young man could have been at work in an attorney's office without being called upon continually to act as a witness and in many other ways leaving traces of his work and name and as mr edwards further points out since the day when lord campbell's book was published between forty and fifty years ago every old deed or will to say nothing of other legal papers dated during the period of william shakespeare's youth has been scrutinized over half a dozen shires and not one signature of the young man has been found moreover if shakespeare had served as clerk in an attorney's office it is clear that he must have served for a considerable period in order to have gained if indeed it is credible that he could have so gained his remarkable knowledge of law can we then for a moment believe that if this had been so tradition would have been absolutely silent on the matter that dowdle's old clerk over eighty years of age should have never heard of it though he was sure enough about the butcher's apprentice and that all the other ancient witnesses should be in similar ignorance but such are the methods of stratfordian controversy tradition is to be scouted when it is found inconvenient but cited as irrefragable truth when it suits the case 
shakespeare of stratford was the author of the plays and poems but the author of the plays and poems could not have been a butcher's apprentice away therefore with tradition but the author of the plays and poems must have had a very large and very accurate knowledge of the law therefore shakespeare of stratford must have been an attorney's clerk the method is simplicity itself by similar reasoning shakespeare has been made a country schoolmaster a soldier a physician a printer and a good many other things besides according to the inclination and the exigencies of the commentator it would not be in the least surprising to find that he was studying latin as a schoolmaster and law in an attorney's office at the same time however we must do mr collins the justice of saying that he has fully recognized what is indeed tolerably obvious that shakespeare must have had a sound legal training it may of course be urged he writes that shakespeare's knowledge of medicine and particularly that branch of it which related to morbid psychology is equally remarkable and that no one has ever contended that he was a physician here mr collins is wrong that contention also has been put forward it may be urged that his acquaintance with the technicalities of other crafts and callings notably of marine and military affairs was also extraordinary and yet no one has suspected him of being a sailor or a soldier wrong again why even messrs garnet and goss suspect that he was a soldier this may be conceded but the concession hardly furnishes an analogy to these and all other subjects he recurs occasionally and in season but with reminiscences of the law his memory as is abundantly clear was simply saturated in season and out of season now in manifest now in recondite application he presses it into the service of expression and illustration at least a third of his myriad metaphors are derived from it it would indeed be difficult to find a single act in any of his dramas nay in some of them a single scene the diction and imagery of which are not colored by it much of his law may have been acquired from three books easily accessible to him namely totel's precedents fifteen seventy two pulton's statutes fifteen seventy eight and france's lawyer's logic fifteen eighty eight works with which he certainly seems to have been familiar but much of it could only have come from one who had an intimate acquaintance with legal proceedings we quite agree with mr castle that shakespeare's legal knowledge is not what could have been picked up in an attorney's office but could only have been learned by an actual attendance at the courts at a pleader's chambers and on circuit or by associating intimately with members of the bench and bar this is excellent but what is mr collins explanation perhaps the simplest solution of the problem is to accept the hypothesis that in early life he was in an attorney's office that he there contracted a love for the law which never left him that as a young man in london he continued to study or dabble in it for his amusement to stroll in leisure hours into the courts and to frequent the society of lawyers on no other supposition is it possible to explain the attraction which the law evidently had for him and his minute and undeviating accuracy in a subject where no layman who has indulged in such copious and ostentatious display of legal technicalities has ever yet succeeded in keeping himself from tripping a lame conclusion no other supposition indeed yes there is another and a very obvious supposition namely that shakespeare was himself a lawyer well versed in his trade versed in all the ways of the courts and living in close intimacy with judges and members of the inns of court one is of course thankful that mr collins has appreciated the fact that shakespeare must have had a sound legal training but i may be forgiven if i do not attach quite so much importance to his pronouncements on this branch of the subject as to those of malone lord campbell judge holmes mr castle k c lord penzance mr grant white and other lawyers who have expressed their opinion on the matter of shakespeare's legal acquirements here it may perhaps be worth while to quote again from lord penzance's book 
as to the suggestion that shakespeare had somehow or other managed to acquire a perfect familiarity with legal principles and an accurate and ready use of the technical terms and phrases not only of the conveyancer's office but of the pleader's chambers and the courts at westminster this as lord penzance points out would require nothing short of employment in some career involving constant contact with legal questions and general legal work but in what portion of shakespeare's career would it be possible to point out that time could be found for the interposition of a legal employment in the chambers or offices of practicing lawyers it is beyond doubt that at an early period he was called upon to abandon his attendance at school and assist his father and was soon after at the age of sixteen bound apprentice to a trade while under the obligation of this bond he could not have pursued any other employment then he leaves stratford and comes to london he has to provide himself with a means of a livelihood and this he did in some capacity at the theatre no one doubts that the holding of horses is scouted by many and perhaps with justice as being unlikely and certainly unproved but whatever the nature of his employment was at the theatre there is hardly room for the belief that it could have been other than continuous for his progress there was so rapid ere long he had been taken into the company as an actor and was soon spoken of as a johannes factotum his rapid accumulation of wealth speaks volumes for the constancy and activity of his services one fails to see when there could be a break in the current of his life at this period of it giving room or opportunity for legal or indeed any other employment in fifteen eighty nine says knight we have undeniable evidence that he had not only a casual engagement was not only a salaried servant as many players were but was a shareholder in the company of the queen's players with other shareholders below him on the list this fifteen eighty nine would be within two years after his arrival in london which is placed by white and hallowell phillips about the year fifteen eighty seven the difficulty in supposing that starting with a state of ignorance in fifteen eighty seven when he is supposed to have come to london he was induced to enter upon a course of most extended study and mental culture is almost insuperable still it was physically possible provided always that he could have had access to the needful books but this legal training seems to me to stand on a different footing it is not only unaccountable and incredible but it is actually negatived by the known facts of his career lord penzance then refers to the fact that by fifteen ninety two according to the best authority mr grant white several of the plays had been written the comedy of errors in fifteen eighty nine love's labors lost in fifteen eighty nine two gentlemen of verona in fifteen eighty nine or fifteen ninety and so forth and then asks with this catalogue of dramatic work on hand was it possible that he could have taken a leading part in the management and conduct of two theatres and if mr phillips is to be relied upon taken his share in the performance of the provincial tours of his company and at the same time devoted himself to the study of the law in all its branches so efficiently as to make himself complete master of its principles and practice and saturate his mind with all its most technical terms i have cited this passage from lord penzance's book because it lay before me and i had already quoted from it on the matter of shakespeare's legal knowledge but other writers have still better set forth the insuperable difficulties as they seem to me which beset the idea that shakespeare might have found time in some unknown period of early life amid multifarious other occupations for the study of classics literature and law to say nothing of languages and a few other matters lord penzance further asks his readers did you ever meet with or hear of an instance in which a young man in this country gave himself up to legal studies and engaged in legal employments which is the only way of becoming familiar with the technicalities of practice unless with a view of practicing in that profession i do not believe that it would be easy or indeed possible to produce an instance in which the law has been seriously studied in all its branches except as a qualification for practice in the legal profession this testimony is so strong so direct 
so authoritative and so uncheapened unwatered by guesses and surmises and maybe so's and might have beens and could have beens and must have beens and the rest of that ton of plaster of paris out of which the biographers have built the colossal brontosaur which goes by the stratford actor's name that it quite convinces me that the man who wrote shakespeare's works knew all about law and lawyers also that that man could not have been the stratford shakespeare and wasn't who did write these works then i wish i knew nine did francis bacon write shakespeare's works nobody knows we cannot say we know a thing when that thing has not been proved no is too strong a word to use when the evidence is not final and absolutely conclusive we can infer if we want to like those slaves no i will not write that word it is not kind it is not courteous the upholders of the stratford shakespeare superstition call us the hardest names they can think of and they keep doing it all the time very well if they like to descend to that level let them do it but i will not so undignify myself as to follow them i cannot call them harsh names the most i can do is to indicate them by terms reflecting my disapproval and this without malice without venom to resume what i was about to say was those thugs have built their entire superstition upon inferences not upon known and established facts it is a weak method and poor and i am glad to be able to say our side never resorts to it while there is anything else to resort to but when we must we must and we have now arrived at a place of that sort since the stratford shakespeare couldn't have written the works we infer that somebody did who was it then this requires some more inferring ordinarily when an unsigned poem sweeps across the continent like a tidal wave whose roar and boom and thunder are made up of admiration delight and applause a dozen obscure people rise up and claim the authorship why a dozen instead of only one or two one reason is because there are a dozen that are recognizably competent to do that poem do you remember beautiful snow do you remember rock me to sleep mother rock me to sleep do you remember backward turn backward o time in thy flight make me a child again just for to-night i remember them very well their authorship was claimed by most of the grown-up people who were alive at the time and every claimant had one plausible argument in his favor at least to wit he could have done the authoring he was competent have the works been claimed by a dozen they haven't there was good reason the world knows there was but one man on the planet at the time who was competent not a dozen and not two a long time ago the dwellers in a far country used now and then to find a procession of prodigious footprints stretching across the plain footprints that were three miles apart each footprint a third of a mile long and a furlong deep and with forests and villages mashed to mush in it was there any doubt as to who made that mighty trail were there a dozen claimants were there two no the people knew who it was that had been along there there was only one hercules there has been only one shakespeare there couldn't be two certainly there couldn't be two at the same time it takes ages to bring forth a shakespeare and some more ages to match him this one was not matched before his time nor during his time and hasn't been matched since the prospect of matching him in our time is not bright the baconians claim that the stratford shakespeare was not qualified to write the works and that francis bacon was they claim that bacon possessed the stupendous equipment both natural and acquired for the miracle and that no other englishman of his day possessed the like or indeed anything closely approaching it macaulay in his essay has much to say about the splendor and horizonless magnitude of that equipment also he has synopsized bacon's history 
a thing which cannot be done for the stratford shakespeare for he hasn't any history to synopsize bacon's history is open to the world from his boyhood to his death in old age a history consisting of known facts displayed in minute and multitudinous detail facts not guesses and conjectures and might have beens whereby it appears that he was born of a race of statesmen and had a lord chancellor for his father and a mother who was distinguished both as a linguist and a theologian she corresponded in greek with bishop jewel and translated his apologia from the latin so correctly that neither he nor archbishop parker could suggest a single alteration it is the atmosphere we are reared in that determines how our inclinations and aspirations shall tend the atmosphere furnished by the parents to the son in this present case was an atmosphere saturated with learning with thinkings and ponderings upon deep subjects and with polite culture it had its natural effect shakespeare of stratford was reared in a house which had no use for books since its owners his parents were without education this may have had an effect upon the son but we do not know because we have no history of him of an informing sort there were but few books anywhere in that day and only the well-to-do and highly educated possessed them they being almost confined to the dead languages all the valuable books then extant in all the vernacular dialects of europe would hardly have filled a single shelf imagine it the few existing books were in the latin tongue mainly a person who was ignorant of it was shut out from all acquaintance not merely with cicero and virgil but with the most interesting memoirs state papers and pamphlets of his own time a literature necessary to the stratford lad for his fictitious reputation's sake since the writer of his works would begin to use it wholesale and in a most masterly way before the lad was hardly more than out of his teens and into his twenties at fifteen bacon was sent to the university and he spent three years there thence he went to paris in the train of the english ambassador and there he mingled daily with the wise the cultured the great and the aristocracy of fashion during another three years a total of six years spent at the sources of knowledge knowledge both of books and of men the three spent at the university were coeval with the second and last three spent by the little stratford lad at stratford school supposedly and perhapsedly and maybe and by inference with nothing to infer from the second three of the baconian six were presumably spent by the stratford lad as apprentice to a butcher that is the thugs presume it on no evidence of any kind which is their way when they want a historical fact fact and presumption are for business purposes all the same to them they know the difference but they also know how to blink it they know too that while in history building a fact is better than a presumption it doesn't take a presumption long to bloom into a fact when they have the handling of it they know by old experience that when they get hold of a presumption tadpole he is not going to stay tadpole in their history tank no they know how to develop him into the giant four-legged bullfrog of fact and make him sit up on his hams and puff out his chin and look important and insolent and come to stay and assert his genuine simon pure authenticity with a thundering bellow that will convince everybody because it is so loud the thug is aware that loudness convinces sixty persons where reasoning convinces but one i wouldn't be a thug not even if but never mind about that it has nothing to do with the argument and it is not noble in spirit besides if i am better than a thug is the merit mine no it is his then to him be the praise that is the right spirit they presume the lad severed his presumed connection with the stratford school to become apprentice to a butcher they also presume that the butcher was his father they don't know there is no written record of it nor any other actual evidence if it would have helped their case any they would have apprenticed him to thirty butchers to fifty butchers to a wilderness of butchers all by their patented method presumption 
if it will help their case they will do it yet and if it will further help it they will presume that all those butchers were his father and the week after they will say it why it is just like being the past tense of the compound reflexive adverbial incandescent hypodermic irregular accusative noun of multitude which is father to the expression which the grammarians call verb it is like a whole ancestry with only one posterity to resume next the young bacon took up the study of law and mastered that abstruse science from that day to the end of his life he was daily in close contact with lawyers and judges not as a casual onlooker in intervals between holding horses in front of a theatre but as a practicing lawyer a great and successful one a renowned one a launcelot of the bar the most formidable lance in the high brotherhood of the legal table round he lived in the law's atmosphere thenceforth all his years and by sheer ability forced his way up its difficult steeps to its supremest summit the lord chancellorship leaving behind him no fellow craftsman qualified to challenge his divine right to that majestic place when we read the praises bestowed by lord penzance and the other illustrious experts upon the legal condition and legal aptnesses brilliances profundities and felicities so prodigally displayed in the plays and try to fit them to the historyless stratford stage manager they sound wild strange incredible ludicrous but when we put them in the mouth of bacon they do not sound strange they seem in their natural and rightful place they seem at home there please turn back and read them again attributed to shakespeare of stratford they are meaningless they are inebriate extravagancies intemperate admirations of the dark side of the moon so to speak attributed to bacon they are admirations of the golden glories of the moon's front side the moon at the full and not intemperate not overwrought but sane and right and justified at every turn and point at which the author required a metaphor simile or illustration his mind ever turned first to the law he seems almost to have thought in legal phrases the commonest legal phrases the commonest of legal expressions were ever at the end of his pen that could happen to no one but a person whose trade was the law it could not happen to a dabbler in it veteran mariners fill their conversation with sailor phrases and draw all their similes from the ship and the sea and the storm but no mere passenger ever does it be he of stratford or elsewhere or could do it with anything resembling accuracy if he were hardy enough to try please read again what lord campbell and the other great authorities have said about bacon when they thought they were saying it about shakespeare of stratford End of section 24. Parts 8 and 9 of Is Shakespeare Dead? This is section 25 of What is Man and Other Essays by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Is Shakespeare Dead? Parts 10, 11, 12, and 13. 10. The Rest of the Equipment The author of the plays was equipped, beyond every other man of his time, with wisdom, erudition, imagination, capaciousness of mind, grace, and majesty of expression. Everyone has said it. No one doubts it. Also, he had humor, humor in rich abundance and always wanting to break out. We have no evidence of any kind that Shakespeare of Stratford possessed any of these gifts or any of these acquirements. The only lines he ever wrote, so far as we know, are substantially barren of them, barren of all of them. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed hair. Blessed be ye man, ye spares these stones, and cursed be he, it moves my bones. Ben Jonson says of Bacon, as orator, His language, where he could spare and pass by a jest, was nobly censorious. 
no man ever spoke more neatly more pressly more weightily or suffered less emptiness less idleness in what he uttered no member of his speech but consisted of his its own graces the fear of every man that heard him was lest he should make an end from macaulay he continued to distinguish himself in parliament particularly by his exertions in favor of one excellent measure on which the king's heart was set the union of england and scotland it was not difficult for such an intellect to discover many irresistible arguments in favor of such a scheme he conducted the great case of the post nati in the exchequer chamber and the decision of the judges a decision the legality of which may be questioned but the beneficial effect of which must be acknowledged was in a great measure attributed to his dexterous management again while actively engaged in the house of commons and in the courts of law he still found leisure for letters and philosophy the noble treatise on the advancement of learning which at a later period was expanded into the de augmentis appeared in sixteen o five the wisdom of the ancients a work which if it had proceeded from any other writer would have been considered as a masterpiece of wit and learning was printed in sixteen o nine in the meantime the novum organum was slowly proceeding several distinguished men of learning had been permitted to see portions of that extraordinary book and they spoke with the greatest admiration of his genius even sir thomas bodley after perusing the cogitata et visa one of the most precious of those scattered leaves out of which the great oracular volume was afterward made up acknowledged that in all proposals and plots in that book bacon showed himself a master workman and that it could not be gainsaid but all the treatise over did abound with choice conceits of the present state of learning and with worthy contemplations of the means to procure it in sixteen twelve a new edition of the essays appeared with editions surpassing the original collection both in bulk and quality nor did these pursuits distract bacon's attention from a work the most arduous the most glorious and the most useful that even his mighty powers could have achieved the reducing and recompiling to use his own phrase of the laws of england to serve the exacting and laborious offices of attorney-general and solicitor-general would have satisfied the appetite of any other man for hard work but bacon had to add the vast literary industries just described to satisfy his he was a born worker the service which he rendered to letters during the last five years of his life amid ten thousand distractions and vexations increase the regret with which we think on the many years which he had wasted to use the words of sir thomas bodley on such study as was not worthy such a student he commenced a digest of the laws of england a history of england under the princes of the house of tudor a body of national history a philosophical romance he made extensive and valuable additions to his essays he published the inestimable treatise de augmentis scientiarum did these labors of hercules fill up his time to his contentment and quiet his appetite for work not entirely the trifles with which he amused himself in hours of pain and languor bore the marks of his mind the best jest book in the world is that which he dictated from memory without referring to any book on a day on which illness had rendered him incapable of serious study here are some scattered remarks from macaulay which throw light upon bacon and seem to indicate and maybe demonstrate that he was competent to write the plays and poems with great minuteness of observation he had an amplitude of comprehension such as has never yet been vouchsafed to any other human being the essays contain abundant proofs that no nice feature of character no peculiarity in the ordering of a house a garden or a court mask could escape the notice of one whose mind was capable of taking in the whole world of knowledge his understanding resembled the tent which the fairy pirabuno gave to prince ahmed fold it and it seemed a toy for the hand of a lady spread it and the armies of the powerful sultans might repose beneath its shade 
the knowledge in which bacon excelled all men was a knowledge of the mutual relations of all departments of knowledge in a letter written when he was only thirty-one to his uncle lord burley he said i have taken all knowledge to be my province though bacon did not arm his philosophy with the weapons of logic he adorned her profusely with all the richest decorations of rhetoric the practical faculty was powerful in bacon but not like his wit so powerful as occasionally to usurp the place of his reason and to tyrannize over the whole man there are too many places in the plays where this happens poor old dying john of gaunt volleying second-rate puns at his own name is a pathetic instance of it we may assume that it is bacon's fault but the stratford shakespeare has to bear the blame no imagination was ever at once so strong and so thoroughly subjugated it stopped at the first check from good sense in truth much of bacon's life was passed in a visionary world amid things as strange as any that are described in the arabian tales amid buildings more sumptuous than the palace of aladdin fountains more wonderful than the golden water of parizade conveyances more rapid than the hippogriff of ruggiero arms more formidable than the lance of astolfo remedies more efficacious than the balsam of fierabras yet in his magnificent daydreams there was nothing wild nothing but what sober reason sanctioned bacon's greatest performance is the first book of the novum organum every part of it blazes with wit but with wit which is employed only to illustrate and decorate truth no book ever made so great a revolution in the mode of thinking overthrew so many prejudices introduced so many new opinions but what we most admire is the vast capacity of that intellect which without effort takes in at once all the domains of science all the past the present and the future all the errors of two thousand years all the encouraging signs of the passing times all the bright hopes of the coming age he had a wonderful talent for packing thought close and rendering it portable his eloquence would alone have entitled him to a high rank in literature it is evident that he had each and every one of the mental gifts and each and every one of the acquirements that are so prodigally displayed in the plays and poems and in much higher and richer degree than any other man of his time or of any previous time he was a genius without a mate a prodigy not matable there was only one of him the planet could not produce two of him at one birth nor in one age he could have written anything that is in the plays and poems he could have written this the cloud-capped towers the gorgeous palaces the solemn temples the great globe itself yea all which it inherit shall dissolve and like an insubstantial pageant faded leave not a rack behind we are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life is rounded with a sleep also he could have written this but he refrained good friend for jesus sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed hair blessed be ye man yet spares these stones and cursed be he yet moves my bones when a person reads the noble verses about the cloud-capped towers he ought not to follow it immediately with good friend for jesus sake forbear because he will find the transition from great poetry to poor prose too violent for comfort it will give him a shock you never notice how commonplace an unpoetic gravel is until you bite into a layer of it in a pie eleven am i trying to convince anybody that shakespeare did not write shakespeare's works ah now what do you take me for would i be so soft as that after having known the human race familiarly for nearly seventy-four years it would grieve me to know that any one could think so injuriously of me so uncomplimentarily so unadmiringly of me no no i am aware that when even the brightest mind in our world has been trained up from childhood in a superstition of any kind it will never be possible for that mind in its maturity to examine sincerely dispassionately and conscientiously 
any evidence or any circumstance which shall seem to cast a doubt upon the validity of that superstition. I doubt if I could do it myself. We always get at second hand our notions about systems of government, and high tariff and low tariff, and prohibition and anti-prohibition, and the holiness of peace and the glories of war, and codes of honor and codes of morals, and approval of the duel and disapproval of it, and our beliefs concerning the nature of cats, and our ideas as to whether the murder of helpless wild animals is base or is heroic, and our preferences in the matter of religious and political parties, and our acceptance or rejection of the Shakespeare's and the Arthur Orton's and the Mrs. Eddy's, we get them all at second hand. We reason none of them out for ourselves. It is the way we are made. It is the way we are all made. And we can't help it. We can't change it. And whenever we have been furnished a fetish, and have been taught to believe in it, and love it, and worship it, and refrain from examining it, there is no evidence, howsoever clear and strong, that can persuade us to withdraw from it our loyalty and our devotion. In morals, conduct, and beliefs we take the color of our environment and associations, and it is a color that can safely be warranted to wash. Whenever we have been furnished with a tar-baby ostensibly stuffed with jewels, and warned that it will be dishonorable and irreverent to disembowel it and test the jewels, we keep our sacrilegious hands off it. We submit, not reluctantly, but rather gladly, for we are privately afraid we should find, upon examination, that the jewels are of the sort that are manufactured at North Adams, Massachusetts. I haven't any idea that Shakespeare will have to vacate his pedestal this side of the year 2209. Disbelief in him cannot come swiftly. Disbelief in a healthy and deeply loved tar-baby has never been known to disintegrate swiftly. It is a very slow process. It took several thousand years to convince our fine race, including every splendid intellect in it, that there is no such thing as a witch. It has taken several thousand years to convince the same fine race, including every splendid intellect in it, that there is no such person as Satan. It has taken several centuries to remove perdition from the Protestant Church's program of post-mortem entertainments. It has taken a weary long time to persuade American Presbyterians to give up infant damnation and try to bear it the best they can. And it looks as if their Scotch brethren will still be burning babies in the everlasting fires when Shakespeare comes down from his perch. We are the reasoning race. We can't prove it by the above examples, and we can't prove it by the miraculous histories built by those Stradfordilators out of a hatful of rags and a barrel of sawdust. But there is a plenty of other things we can prove it by, if I could think of them. We are the reasoning race, and when we find a vague file of chipmunk tracks stringing through the dust of Stratford Village, we know by our reasoning bowers that Hercules has been along there. I feel that our fetish is safe for three centuries yet. The bust, too, there in the Stratford Church. The precious bust, the priceless bust, the calm bust, the serene bust, the emotionless bust, with the dandy moustache and the putty face, unseamed of care, that face which has looked passionlessly down upon the awed pilgrim for a hundred and fifty years, and will still look down upon the awed pilgrim three hundred more, with the deep, 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 subtle, subtle, subtle expression of a bladder. 12. Irreverence one of the most trying defects which I find in these, these, what shall I call them? For I will not apply injurious epithets to them, the way they do to us, such violations of courtesy being repugnant to my nature and my dignity. The farthest I can go in that direction is to call them by names of limited reverence, names merely descriptive, never unkind, never offensive, never tainted by harsh feeling. If they would do like this, they would feel better in their hearts. 
very well then to proceed one of the most trying defects which i find in these stratfordilators these shakespeareids these thugs these bangalores these troglodytes these harumphrodites these blatherskites these buccaneers these bandoliers is their spirit of irreverence it is detectable in every utterance of theirs when they are talking about us i am thankful that in me there is nothing of that spirit when a thing is sacred to me it is impossible for me to be irreverent toward it i cannot call to mind a single instance where i have ever been irreverent except towards the things which were sacred to other people am i in the right i think so but i ask no one to take my unsupported word no look at the dictionary let the dictionary decide here is the definition irreverence the quality or condition of irreverence toward god and sacred things what does the hindu say he says it is correct he says irreverence is lack of respect for vishnu and brahma and krishna and his other gods and for his sacred cattle and for his temples and the things within them he endorses the definition you see and there are three hundred million hindus or their equivalents back of him the dictionary had the acute idea that by using the capital g it could restrict irreverence to lack of reverence for our deity and our sacred things but that ingenious and rather sly idea miscarried for by the simple process of spelling his deities with capitals the hindu confiscates the definition and restricts it to his own sects thus making it clearly compulsory upon us to revere his gods and his sacred things and nobody's else we can't say a word for he has our own dictionary at his back and its decision is final this law reduced to its simplest terms is this one whatever is sacred to the christian must be held in reverence by everybody else two whatever is sacred to the hindu must be held in reverence by everybody else three therefore by consequence logically and indisputably whatever is sacred to me must be held in reverence by everybody else now then what aggravates me is that these troglodytes and muscovites and bandoliers and buccaneers are also trying to crowd in and share the benefit of the law and compel everybody to revere their shakespeare and hold him sacred we can't have that there's enough of us already if you go on widening and spreading and inflating the privilege it will presently come to be conceded that each man's sacred things are the only ones and the rest of the human race will have to be humbly reverent toward them or suffer for it that can surely happen and when it happens the word irreverence will be regarded as the most meaningless and foolish and self-conceited and insolent and impudent and dictatorial word in the language and people will say whose business is it what gods i worship and what things hold sacred who has the right to dictate to my conscience and where did he get that right we cannot afford to let that calamity come upon us we must save the word from this destruction there is but one way to do it and that is to stop the spread of the privilege and strictly confine it to its present limits that is to all the christian sects to all the hindu sects and me we do not need any more the stock is watered enough just as it is it would be better if the privilege were limited to me alone i think so because i am the only sect that knows how to employ it gently kindly charitably dispassionately the other sects lack the quality of self-restraint the catholic church says the most irreverent things about matters which are sacred to the protestants and the protestant church retorts in kind about the confessional and other matters which catholics hold sacred then both of these irreverencers turn upon thomas paine and charge him with irreverence this is all unfortunate because it makes it difficult for students equipped with only a low grade of mentality to find out what irreverence really is it will surely be much better all around if the privilege of regulating the irreverent and keeping them in order shall eventually be withdrawn from all the sects but me then there will be no more quarrelling no more banding of disrespectful epithets no more heart-burnings 
there will then be nothing sacred involved in this bacon shakespeare controversy except what is sacred to me that will simplify the whole matter and trouble will cease there will be irreverence no longer because i will not allow it the first time those criminals charge me with irreverence for calling their stratford myth and arthur orton mary baker thompson eddy lewis the seventeenth veiled prophet of corazan will be the last taught by the methods found effective in extinguishing earlier offenders by the inquisition of holy memory i shall know how to quiet them thirteen isn't it odd when you think of it that you may list all the celebrated englishmen irishmen and scotsmen of modern times clear back to the first tutors a list containing five hundred names shall we say and you can go to the histories biographies and cyclopedias and learn the particulars of the lives of every one of them every one of them except one the most famous the most renowned by far the most illustrious of them all shakespeare you can get the details of the lives of all the celebrated ecclesiastics in the list all the celebrated tragedians comedians singers dancers orators judges lawyers poets dramatists historians biographers editors inventors reformers statesmen generals admirals discoverers prize-fighters murderers pirates conspirators horse jockeys bunco steerers misers swindlers explorers adventurers by land and sea bankers financiers astronomers naturalists claimants impostors chemists biologists geologists philologists college presidents and professors architects engineers painters sculptors politicians agitators rebels revolutionists patriots demagogues clowns cooks freaks philosophers burglars highwaymen journalists physicians surgeons you can get the life histories of all of them but one just one the most extraordinary and the most celebrated of them all shakespeare you may add to the list the thousand celebrated persons furnished by the rest of christendom in the past four centuries and you can find out the life histories of all those people too you will then have listed fifteen hundred celebrities and you can trace the authentic life histories of the whole of them save one far and away the most colossal prodigy of the entire accumulation shakespeare about him you can find out nothing nothing of even the slightest importance nothing worth the trouble of stowing away in your memory nothing that even remotely indicates that he was ever anything more than a distinctly commonplace person a manager an actor of inferior grade a small trader in a small village that did not regard him as a person of any consequence and had forgotten all about him before he was fairly cold in his grave we can go to the records and find out the life history of every renowned racehorse of modern times but not shakespeare's there are many reasons why and they have been furnished in cartloads of guess and conjecture by those troglodytes but there is one that is worth all the rest of the reasons put together and is abundantly sufficient all by itself he hadn't any history to record there is no way of getting around that deadly fact and no sane way has yet been discovered of getting around its formidable significance it's quite plain significance to any but those thugs i do not use the term unkindly is that shakespeare had no prominence while he lived and none until he had been dead two or three generations the plays enjoyed high fame from the beginning and if he wrote them it seems a pity the world did not find it out he ought to have explained that he was the author and not merely a nom de plume for another man to hide behind if he had been less intemperately solicitous about his bones and more solicitous about his works it would have been better for his good name and a kindness to us the bones were not important they will moulder away they will turn to dust but the works will endure until the last sun goes down mark twain p s march twenty fifth about two months ago i was illuminating this autobiography with some notions of mine concerning the bacon shakespeare controversy 
and i then took occasion to air the opinion that the stratford shakespeare was a person of no public consequence or celebrity during his lifetime but was utterly obscure and unimportant and not only in great london but also in the little village where he was born where he lived a quarter of a century and where he died and was buried i argued that if he had been a person of any note at all aged villagers would have had much to tell about him many and many a year after his death instead of being unable to furnish inquirers a single fact connected with him i believed and i still believe that if he had been famous his notoriety would have lasted as long as mine has lasted in my native village out in missouri it is a good argument a prodigiously strong one and most formidable one for even the most gifted and ingenious and plausible stratfordilator to get around or explain away to-day a hannibal courier post of recent date has reached me with an article in it which reinforces my contention that a really celebrated person cannot be forgotten in his village in the short space of sixty years i will make an extract from it hannibal as a city may have many sins to answer for but ingratitude is not one of them or reverence for the great men she has produced and as the years go by her greatest son mark twain or s l clemens as a few of the unlettered call him grows in the estimation and regard of the residents of the town he made famous and the town that made him famous his name is associated with every old building that is torn down to make way for the modern structures demanded by a rapidly growing city and with every hill or cave over or through which he might by any possibility have roamed while the many points of interest which he wove into his stories such as holiday hill jackson's island or mark twain cave are now monuments to his genius hannibal is glad of any opportunity to do him honor as he has honored her so it has happened that the old-timers who went to school with mark or were with him on some of his usual escapades have been honored with large audiences whenever they were in a reminiscent mood and condescended to tell of their intimacy with the ordinary boy who came to be a very extraordinary humorist and whose every boyish act is now seen to have been indicative of what was to come like aunt becky and mrs clemens they can now see that mark was hardly appreciated when he lived here and that the things he did as a boy and was whipped for doing were not all bad after all so they have been in no hesitancy about drawing out the bad things he did as well as the good in their efforts to get a mark twain story all incidents being viewed in the light of his present fame until the volume of twainiana is already considerable and growing in proportion as the old-timers drop away and the stories are retold second and third hand by their descendants with some seventy-three years young and living in a villa instead of a house he is a fair target and let him incorporate copyright or patent himself as he will there are some of his works that will go swooping up hannibal chimneys as long as graybeards gather about the fires and begin with i've heard father tell or possibly once when i the mrs clemens referred to is my mother was my mother and here is another extract from a hannibal paper of date twenty days ago miss becca blankenship died at the home of william dickison four o eight rock street at two thirty o'clock yesterday afternoon aged seventy-two years the deceased was a sister of huckleberry finn one of the famous characters in mark twain's tom sawyer she had been a member of the dickison family the housekeeper for nearly forty-five years and was a highly respected lady for the past eight years she had been an invalid but was as well cared for by mr dickison and his family as if she had been a near relative she was a member of the park methodist church and a christian woman i remember her well i have a picture of her in my mind which was craven there clear and sharp and vivid sixty-three years ago she was at that time nine years old and i was about eleven i remember where she stood and how she looked and i can still see her bare feet her bare head her brown face and her short tolinen frock she was crying what it was about i have long ago forgotten but it was the tears that preserved the picture for me no doubt 
She was a good child, I can say that for her. She knew me nearly seventy years ago. Did she forget me in the course of time? I think not. If she had lived in Stratford in Shakespeare's time, would she have forgotten him? Yes, for he was never famous during his lifetime. He was utterly obscure in Stratford, and there wouldn't be any occasion to remember him after he had been dead a week. Injun Joe, Jimmy Finn, and General Gaines were prominent and very intemperate ne'er-do-wheels in Hannibal two generations ago. Plenty of gray heads there remember them to this day, and can tell you about them. Isn't it curious that two town drunkards and one half-breed loafer should leave behind them, in a remote Missourian village, a fame a hundred times greater and several hundred times more particularized in the matter of definite facts than Shakespeare left behind him in the village where he had lived the half of his lifetime? End of Is Shakespeare Dead? And end of section 25 of What is Man? and other essays by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman.